Okay, perfect. Hey guys, how are y'all doing? What's good? Y'all alive? <laughs> Half alive. NB isn't as terrible as everybody says it's going to be. It's intense because it's neuroscience, but it's doable. I actually did really decently on NB1. I think it's um it's new. Like a lot of people have seen the Krebs cycle and stuff in undergrad a million times. Yeah. So it's just kind of a new way of learning. Um, yeah. But we're going to talk through it. Here's the plan. Um, I unfortunately have somewhere to be later. So what we're going to do, I'm going to cover the first two weeks of the module. Then I'm going to have to run. Lindsay's going to cover the last week. But um, what I definitely want to get straight for you guys is these tracks and how we need to uh, orient ourselves when we do them. Um, my advice is actually uh, if you can get some sort of outside resource, like what are they? Pretest. Uh, what's the other ones, Lindsay? I, um, uh, BRS. Yeah. Uh, BRS Neurology. If you could find a PDF of that, you could just message those. If you, need it. Um, you get the books, right? Those PDFs, because you need to practice with these tracks, uh, with these lesions. Thing is, if you had all day, it's fine, but you don't. So you just need to get fast at doing these, these sorts of problems. Um, what's the other one? BRS, pretest, somebody. We don't have pre made slides. No, we don't. Um, what's the other one? I forget. Oh, Guyton and Hall. Yeah. Yeah. Guyton yeah, yeah. Hall. So just so you know, pretests tend to be like ridiculously hard compared to the other books. So like, just, you know, if you're not doing great on those, just know that. Um, but yeah, so uh, the thing is, I was very shocked when we took this exam, uh, how many track questions we had, right? And it was like, why didn't they give us more practice questions with these like third and fourth order, um, you know, uh, you know, problems and that, you know, it's difficult because it encompasses three or four lectures at one time, you're trying to put the sensory systems, the motor systems together. Um, so you need to go find outside resource questions and practice and get fast at them and get confident. Um, that should be, I, I, ho I heard y'all have a couple of days off this week. Yes, so you should de dedicate your time um, to doing practice questions. All right, we don't have pre-made slides. So what we're gonna do is go through our old material, our old notes. Um, uh, one of your classmates was kind enough to send me your schedule, which was a little bit different than ours, but um, I went through and organized it so that it should correlate. I posted all my notes on my drive. The link was in the email I sent out. Um, so you can see, and I'll kind of talk y'all through how like I neurotically like highlight my notes so that y'all could, um, so y'all could kind of like see what my thought process was. Pretest neurology, the neuro neurobiology or neurology one um, would be a good one to look at. Um, all right, share screen, let me see. All right, quickly, yep, it, the video will be posted hopefully later today, if not today, tomorrow. Um, the links are here, over here, right? So it'll bring you to this, this is the term two playlist. All of the reviews are here. Hopefully you had had time to look at our NV1 review from last term. This will be similar. Um, but uh, as always, we've done this already. So if you want to get a head start, I know a lot of people do. You can look at these ahead of time and, um, you know, hopefully that helps. All right. As I said, under neuro, your, your class NV1 lecture notes, I posted my entire, all my le lecture notes for NV1. All right. So you can kind of see if you're like, I don't know what's important or not go through, you can look at these and see how I highlight my stuff. As always, this is not associated with school or IEA, but you should follow IEA on Instagram. We're doing tutoring now. If you're looking for a tutor, um, sign up. It takes a little while, a few days to get matched up with someone. But if you're looking for that, um, you can uh, sign up there. And of course, we update. We have questions of the day, which are always helpful. All right, good. All right, so we'll start at the beginning. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know Kishore ran through some of the stuff with you last time. Um, unfortunately, the first week is kind of weird. It's like not super important, but you kind of need to have like a little baseline for it. So there's not too much understanding. I'm gonna go quickly and just kind of point out some of the, uh, the things that were important. Of course, the breakdown of, you know, where everything comes from embryologically, telencephalon, diencephalon, mesencephalon, metencephalon, myelencephalon. Uh, I think first aid has it uh, as tell, die, mes, met, my. Like if you just say that a few times, you can keep it straight. The big thing that they love to ask is that the it's the uh, the metencephalon uh, also includes the cerebellum, 
Okay, so when you think about it, uh, your cerebral hemispheres, telencephalon, diencephalon, is uh, the thalamus and kind of the the um, the, in, uh, the, the medial uh, aspect uh, of the brain. The mesencephalon. Now you're starting to talk about the brain stem. So mesencephalon is the midbrain. Metencephalon is the pons, and also includes um, the cerebellum. As I said, that's what they like to ask because that's like the outlier. Where's the cerebellum from? It's part of the mesencephalon. It kind of comes right off of the pons. It has those peduncles that uh, give rise to it. And then myelencephalon is the bottom part, uh, the medulla. And um, yeah, so know that. And you can see that here, um, forebrain obviously is those two, midbrain, mesencephalon, and hindbrain is the bottom, right? So, oh yeah, we'll do that too. We'll talk about that rostrocaudal thing. That's kind of a pain, um, but we'll do that in a little bit. All right. So again, you're just orienting yourself. Remember, gray matter is always cellular. White matter is always fibers. Okay, so um, it, you know that'll help you. It's it's different. It's oriented differently in the brain from the spinal cord. So when you think about the brain, the cells are on the outside. The gray matter, the the white matter, or all of the neurons are on the inside. Whereas when you think about the spinal column, the butterfly, right? The butterfly on the inside is the gray matter, the cells, right? And the white matter on the outside is the fibers, the tracks, right? Okay, um, let's see. Again, I'm just going through this quickly. Just if I, if I see anything I feel you need to know, I'll let you know. Um, one of, we're gonna talk about the different cell types in a little bit, but there are some differences in the oligodendrocytes and swan cells that are important, but we'll do that in a bit. Of course, as always, you've learned the different muscle fibers. Um, I think it's fair game to throw a histology slide at you guys and ask you what's the endoneurin versus perineurin. They like perineurin because it's kind of in the middle. Um, it, it looks a little bit different on, um, on histology. And then of course the epineurin goes around the outside. So make a note, make sure you can identify the histology. Um, it's basically the same as the muscle, except you're looking at the nerve, right? The nerve bundles are gonna be around the perineurin, whereas the endoneurin is smaller and the epi goes around everything. Uh, conceptually, the nodes of Ranvier are very important because this is the concept of myelination. Myelination is a, it, it's an insulation, right? It's just like any sort of electrical wire you use, right? So the more insulation you have, uh, the more of a conduction or um, uh, an efficient way of conducting electricity across it. So, right, so you myelinate it. And what it actually has is the swan cells, at least in the peripheral nervous system, uh, they, they lay down this insulation and you have these nodes right here. So the conduction can jump across different nodes and it goes a lot faster. It's a, it's a more efficient process. But when we talk about later on, when we talk about the different, um, you know, the ALS versus um, the DCML tracks, we'll talk about the myelination and how that works. But this is a very uh, important process for speed of conduction, right? Being myelinated and the nodes are very important because that is how you get synaptic transmission. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see, uh, I, I didn't pull all the DLAs. I'm sure you've noticed by now, a lot of the DLAs are um, very similar to the lectures, right? Uh, one thing I didn't add that I wanted to mention to y'all, y'all did cover the pharyngeal arches and grooves and clefts. Uh, just make a note, go, go look at that in first aid. They have really easy mnemonics. It's basically memorization. Just know what comes from what. Um, and like DeGeorge is involved with that as well. Uh, but it, you, you'll get all the points right for that. Um, and then y'all do cover it again when y'all do cranial nerves in MB2. Disclaimer on that, I, in an ideal world, you would know the cranial nerves going into this. It would make this a little bit simpler, but this is just way, the way they set up the curriculum. So um, I know towards the week three, y'all did a lot of, or y'all started doing the eye and ear histology, but you still haven't done the cranial nerves. So it, it, it's a give or take, like it, you could say it the other way. I wish I would have learned the ear histology before the cranial nerves. They just decided to do it this way. So basically most of NB2 is gonna be cranial nerves and the testing for that. So don't stress too much if you don't understand that now, they're gonna to get to it later. All right, so a little bit more anatomy. Again, when they talk about the cranial nerves, this is gonna be much more important. The different areas um, of, the, of the, uh, the, the cranial vault. Uh, I would take note of this slide just because it kind of tells you where everything goes. Um, again, when y'all get to the cranial nerves, this will get this will become much more important. But y'all did talk about, for example, um, epidural hematomas. We know the middle meningeal, meningeal artery is the prime culprit with that. And for instance, that comes from the foramen spinosum. Okay, so it looks like a spine, whereas foramen ovale actually looks like an oval. 
Um, so if you keep that in mind, uh, it'll make those easier if they actually give you an image of the cranial vault. But again, this is more of NV2, an NV2 problem, okay? All right, I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. And again, some of the lower aspects, the cranial nerves, uh, they also go through different cavities, okay? Uh, not if you don't know this, just keep in mind, cranial nerves don't cross. When we talk, well, you know the word decussate, y'all heard that word, that means cross. The cranial nerves don't decussate, like the different tracks, it's the sensory and motor tracks. So if you have some sort of palsy to the right side of your face, uh, it's the right cranial nerve, the right cranial nerve seven, okay? So they don't, don't worry about those crossing. But for the millionth time, y'all will worry about that at NB2. So again, they're just introducing you to this, but you'll have to know this uh, in detail later on. But we'll, when we do our NV2 review, we'll uh, be sure to go through that. All right. Now, I, this is more memorization as well. Um, yeah, right. So dendrites always come off of the cell body and travel down. You can see here, you can see the nodes. So this is a myelinated axon. And then you have these non-myelinated axon terminals that kind of come off towards the muscle or wherever they're going. Um, and uh, just so you know, like I know some people skip over these. I read these, I find that they're, um, they, they may not be tested, but they do give additional information, especially if you're like me and you're not great about paying attention in lecture. Um, these have good information to help uh, outline the slides. Okay. Um, Right, you know this by now, this is some FDM stuff. Kinesin always also is always anterior grade while dynein retrograde, if the word dynein sounds familiar, remember uh, cartagener syndrome is a dynein arm problem with cartageners. You have a cilia problem, you have sinus inversus, so all the organs are on opposite sides. They have problems with the cilia, so they have respiratory problems. Their the guys are infertile because of sperm, uh, stuff like that. So um, keep in mind, easy points, dynein always goes backwards. And you can see that here. Some viruses, y'all probably wouldn't get tested on this, but herpes and rabies actually use that retrograde transport to get to the CNS. All right. Um, and some more uh, basic uh, memorization. Remember that motor neurons are always going to be multipolar neurons. Uh, it's sensory are going to be your pseudo unipolar. So that means that you can see the cell kind of coming off the midpoint of this. And then those special senses like eye and ear and stuff like that will be this uh, bipolar neuron. So uh, there could be a giveaway in the question if it's multipolar M for multi for motor M and M and then pseudo unipolar is going to be your sensory. All right. And then this as you know, <clears throat> y'all have learned this before, uh, when we look at our brain stem, sensory is gonna come in through the dorsal side, ventral is gonna come out from the, from the anterior side. And then we know that uh, that lateral side right here is our autonomic system and it, it, it'll travel mostly on the, on the anterior side. And by all means, if y'all have questions, just speak up. I don't, y'all know by now, I don't have the chat open, so uh, you won't offend me. All right, now some of the cells, these are super important. So astrocytes are typically, when you think of astrocytes or when you talk of uh, like the word gliosis is gliosis is like fibrosis, but in the CNS, okay? So anytime you have some sort of injury, these astrocytes, these foot processes, they kind of surround the injured area and it, beco it becomes uh, gliotic or gliosis, right? So it becomes like a fibrous area. Um, but so when you think of that, these astrocytes, they also have uh, other process or other jobs. Again, the same principle, like as you're walling off this, this um, necrotic area, you also can do the same thing with these foot processes and form the blood brain barrier, right? Um, and then some of these other things, but the most, th the most, um, important thing you need to remember if, if there is any sort of injury, these astrocytes are what's gonna come in um, along with the microglia, but we'll get there in a second. But these astrocytes are what's gonna come in and kind of form this gliosis or the scar tissue. Um, see, I just, I just don't feel like a lot of this is tested. Now, uh, microglia are, as it have, oh, let me just, sorry, I should have prefaced this before. This is how I highlight if you haven't seen my notes before. Red is like super important. It's like buzzwords, it's like, make sure you know it. Green is like lists of things or like super, you know, not super important, but like medium important, like things I, I, I wanna be sure I have like, sort of like this, like lists. 
And then um, yellow is kind of just like extra material that I just don't want to gloss over. But um, if you go through my stuff, if you see it in red, that generally means like that's a good buzzword for a test, it's question and stuff like that. All right, so yeah, so microglia are just your CNS macrophages. So they're gonna come up, they're gonna engulf any, any sort of um, infection or any sort of uh, cellular uh, problem that's going on. Your microglia is gonna come in there just like macrophages um, and they're gonna come in and um, eat up the tissue. Now, after that's done, that's when the astrocytes come in and they form this gliosis or surround the, the injured area um, so that, um, you know, you, you can, um, you know, that you, you can, in a healing process, right? It's for the fibrosis is basically a healing process. It's scar tissue. All right, so here's a good important point. When you're differentiating uh, oligodendrocytes versus swan cells, we know oligodendrocytes are gonna be in the CNS, swan cells are gonna be in, in the peripheral nervous system. Another important differentiating fact is that uh, oligodendrocytes can myelinate multiple neurons, okay? So think of there's, billions and trillions of neurons that need to be myelinated in the brain. So these oligodendrocytes have to myelinate multiple, whereas the swan cells in the peripheral nervous system, they are only going to myelinate one fiber, but it's a huge fiber, right? A lot of times it's like, you know, going, going all the way down your arm, right? So just remember that oligodendrocytes can do multiple swan cells, uh, can just do one and they're in the penis. Now somebody tell, can tell me what, what diseases are we talking about between these two demyelinating diseases? one for each of them that you should definitely be aware of. Anybody, CNS, which one? What's that? So, right, so demyelinating in the, in the, in the central nervous system is multiple sclerosis, okay? Um, typically, their erratic patterns of demyelination, uh, patients uh, generally, uh, middle-aged females come in with blurry vision. That's the first sign, but they get this waxing waning effect of um, this autoimmune process where they get um, demyelination and they'll recover from it and then it'll get worse. But it doesn't seem like there's any um, regular pattern to it. It seems very um, random in, in what gets demyelinated versus like they, they'll have unilateral sensory problems on one side, weakness in the leg of the other side, blurry vision. So it's very random. But when you think of multiple sclerosis, demyelination, you're thinking of the CNS, okay? So a problem there. Does anybody know in the peripheral nervous system, which one we talk about? The swan cells. Uh, Guillain-Barre. Guillain yeah, exactly, right? And the, the key thing to remember there is they'll tell you they just had a, a viral infection. Typically it's a GI infection. Um, I don't think they've, they've definitively identified what causes it because sometimes it could be some random virus. But I think the idea is that some people are predisposed to it and you have this auto, well, this immune reaction to this GI virus, and then uh, for whatever reason, it attacks your swan cells. Okay, so when you look at it, um, you'll think of some sort of peripheral neuropathy that happens, um, and that is secondary to some sort of recent two weeks or so viral infection. Generally, this resolves itself. Um, if you haven't seen this, you can go on YouTube and look at it, but some people will be like, I literally couldn't feel, I couldn't feel anything in, in my whole you know, upper and lower limbs. Um, but it's just, it's kind of a, a wild thing uh, to think about for a couple of months that you wouldn't be able to have any sensation. But typically it resolves, um, uh, whereas MS, you know, it's a chronic process, okay? So that's a good differentiator. You always wanna correlate what are the, um, what are the pathologies involved with these? What are the diseases I need to remember in regards to this? Okay, ependymal cells are gonna make your CSF, right? They also line the, um, the ventricles, okay? So um, it forms this blood CSF barrier uh, as well. So that's what you're gonna wanna remember for those. They're gonna, they're gonna be what secretes the CSF, okay? Um, all right, this is a little confusing, but um, just seeing that typically, uh, Central nervous system, you know, injuries uh, to, uh, you know, nervous system injuries, they don't, they don't correct themselves. When you think about paralysis and stuff like that, um, it's, it's a severe, um, you know, problem. It's a severe disease. It's a severe injury that happens that uh, is not uh, repairable. Whereas sometimes, sometimes in the peripheral nervous system, uh, you can get uh, um, a repairing of these, um, of these neurons. And if you could see here, uh, it's about two millimeters, what does that say? 
two millimeters a day. So yeah, so even though it does, you can get a peripheral nerve um, a repair, it's super slow, right? Um, but this process of Wallerian degeneration is the process if the nerve gets injured, if the nerve gets cut, the area distal to it kind of um, um, dies off, right? It's apoptose. And then you kind of make sprouts from the proximal section. You could kind of think of everything downstream from the injury. You got to get rid of it and you got to lay down new pipe, right? You got to lay down new, new um, electrical wire, right? Because everything downstream of it is going to die off anyway. So that's the process of Wallerian degeneration. Um, but the, proce the process, of course, since we're in the peripheral nervous system, involves swan cells. But again, it's a very slow process. All right, and here we go. So, right, so definitely start this slide. Make sure you know the differences here, MS versus Guillain-Barre. Um, but keep in mind, like you want, I, I, very few questions are going to not involve that, that viral infection because it's really a giveaway for Guillain-Barre, ascending paralysis. Okay, cool. All right. Now, again, look, metencephalon, pons plus the cerebellum. You will get a question like that. They like to ask that. So you can see everything, uh, how it develops here. Um, and so we can go into the different lobes, right? So frontal lobe is kind of what makes us human, right? These are our, um, uh, it's almost, well, you think of it as your advanced thought process, but much of that is an inhibitory process. So your, your emotional cortex is very, um, uh, is very primitive in a sense that, you know, like it, the sexual drive and everything that goes into it. So your frontal lobe, your higher order thinking does a lot of inhibitory processes to where saying like, this is not socially acceptable for me to act this way, right? So a good example for this is um, when you're sleeping, your frontal lobe kind of goes to sleep, right? And your emotional cortex is where uh, you get your dreams. So if you have very vivid dreams, uh, a lot of times it's because that frontal cortex is, uh, is sleeping and so your, your emotional center is kind of uh, upregulated. So um, you get vivid dreams. Interesting fact, taking melatonin, if you've done that before, kind of puts your frontal lobe to sleep a little bit further. Therefore, um, I, I, I'm one of them and take melatonin like crazy dreams, right? So that's kind of the process there. So your frontal lobe is your higher order thought. Your temporal lobe has a lot to do with your, um, with your uh, hearing. And y'all will get into that when you start doing um, the, the cranial nerves and stuff, but hearing, sight, stuff like that. Parietal lobe is generally considered your spatial awareness. Uh, people talk about art and stuff like that, but things to do with that um, are like your place in space, right? Like not proprioception, but um, your ability to govern like the, your uh, surroundings. And then the occipital lobe obviously has to do with vision. So it's Can much more common. Can you give an example of, of what's parietal? that? Like, uh, like how you give for the frontal? Like in the vignette, like I get confused when it's like so difficult language that's used in the notes. Yeah, like so if I am in the parietal. Lobe. Yeah, so like even just navigation, like like being able to know like your way through, um, or like for example, like they'll say they could use like a clock. They could tell you to draw a clock and say like, can you make the clock say five fifteen? Like stuff like that, and your ability to draw a picture or replicate a picture, stuff like that. Um, that's kind of where your parietal lobe goes. But they say people that are artists tend to have a very strong parietal lobe because it has to do with that ability, even color awareness and um, your ability to you know, orient yourself. Um, that's kind of how that goes, yeah. All right, and then of course your limbic lobe is that primitive emotional cortex that, um, yeah, that you know, controls your, uh, your, your emotions. All right, um, and then this isn't super important, this insular lobe that's down here. I believe they said it has some, what does it have to do? It has to do with like um, hearing or taste or something like that. I think the gustatory center is somewhere in there. Um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. All right, so, and then when we get down into the uh, deep forebrain, when we talk about the basal ganglia, that's very primitive too as well, because um, it has to do with a lot with motor movements, okay? So problems with such as Huntington's disease, problems such as Parkinson's disease, dopaminergic problems, um, these can relate to uh, um, the basal ganglia. So when you talk about um, motor movements, uh, that's what you're worried about there. And then the thalamus is there. The thalamus is much like 
a like a relay center, right? So uh, all the sensory tracks always come up to the thalamus and then the thalamus kind of is the center of the brain that kind of tells all the fibers where to go from there, okay? So now along with this, the cerebellum is, um, is intimately involved with this process with the basal ganglia because the, the cerebellum helps to modulate fine motor movements such as your fingers and stuff. So you can think of the basal ganglia as um, you know uh, crude crude movements, uh, whereas the cerebellum will help with your with your fine movements. Okay, and these are just definition. Very importantly, the striatum is the caudate and the putamen. You need to keep that in mind. Uh, they like that because they can tell you Huntington's disease is the problem in the caudate. Well, technically, because the striatum, uh, technically because the caudate is part of the striatum, um, uh, then then Huntington's also involves the striatum, right? So they could use those interchangeably. Um, but I would also know uh, where these lie, right? So green is the thalamus. Um, it's not uh, outlined here. To me, I don't know. I'm weird, I guess. Uh, you can see the ventricles. They look like eyes, and it looks like a little nose here, and these look like cheeks and a little mouth, and then maybe like a goatee. The goatee is the uh, substantia nigra, that's where the dopamine um, neurons are that get um, that get degenerated in um, Parkinson's, okay? All right, and then, yeah, you can see the hippocampus uh, outlines here. Yeah, you could kind of see that, I, I think we actually did have a question on that, um, um, but uh, I like actually like a picture like this where they outlined it like this. And it was like between this and the amygdala trying to differentiate it. So you could see like it has this curve structure to it. So if you see the curve, um, that's the hippocampus. I want to show you the amygdala. I believe it runs right in front of it. Um, uh, so you have to if they're, if they're pointing to this, you need to see this curve structure, I guess, like this seahorse here. So the hippocampus. And yeah, exactly right here. So you can see the amygdala runs right for in front of it. And we know the amygdala is like your fear center, right? So it, it controls your fear. And again, it's more of an inhibitor, inhibitory process, right? If you had some sort of interaction with a snake as a child, your amygdala shows fear for that. But the, the, the evolutionary reason for that is because um, you found that as a threat when you were young. So you store that in your mind in the event that uh, you see a snake again, you can avoid it, right? So it may be, um, a heightened response to that, but your brain doesn't really know that. It just knows that you need to stay away from stuff like that, okay? But they like to test on it because um, if y'all have come across the disease kluver busi syndrome, uh, these people have hypersexuality, hyperorality. Um, they're very disinhibited, right? They're very, you know, um, perverse, I guess you could say for lack of a better word, but the problem is they have bilateral amygdala lesions, right? So they don't have any fear. There's, there's no fear with, you know, just running around doing whatever you want. Y'all can look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about. But um, yeah, that's a very good example. If you don't have any fear, if you don't have any uh, inhibitory process, such as like the frontal lobe does, if you're not able to um, inhibit that process, um, you tend to be disinhibited. You don't have that filter on your mouth. An example that's very similar to kluver busi is frontotemporal lobe dementia. If you have a frontal lobe dementia, you lose the cells there, okay? So you don't have that inhibitory process to tell your body, this is not appropriate to say out loud. So sometimes older people that um, just, it seems like they just say whatever's on their mind. A lot of times that's due to the frontal lobe having dementia and they don't have the, the part of their brain to be like, maybe you shouldn't say that, right? Okay, so that's kind of how that works. Y'all will get to the dimensions later, but I just wanted to mention that for, um, just so you knew. No, okay, so you could see that very importantly that the thalamus is right around the third ventricle. You could see that there, that cerebral aqueduct that goes down, um, but you could see the thalamus, like I said, it's basically a relay center. Those sensory fibers, those third order, or second to third order connection on the neurons, uh, those go through the thalamus and the thalamus directs where that sensory uh, neuron needs to go into the brain. All right. Uh, some just basic definitions. White matter again are connection fibers, right? They're just uh, they're just neurons. They're just tracks. So you need to know these basic definitions. Association fibers are in the same hemisphere. So like Broca or Wernicke's area, talking to Broca's area. I'm not positive y'all talked about this yet, but Wernicke's is where language is, where you hear. Broca's where you speak. Okay, so they kind of need to talk together. So if they're on, since they're on the same hemisphere, they're on the left. Um, these would be association fibers. The fibers are actually called the arcuate fasciculus. 
Um, Y'all will probably get into that later. Um, but yeah, so that's same side. Commissural fibers cross to the other side. The corpus callosum is what uh, actually takes the fibers from the left to the right. Interesting example, some people have intractable epilep uh, uh, epilepsy, right? And what they ended up doing because it, I mean, I'm talking like thousands of seizures a day, right? You just can't, hundreds of seizures a day. You just can't stop it. So what they did, they actually cut the brain directly in half. They cut these commissural fibers. And it's very interesting. It did stop the seizures, but it was almost like the person was two different people. Like the right arm would go to do something like scratch the face and the left arm would pull it away. Like they had no, they had no interactions, all right? So that's what's important. These commercial fibers, they go across the corpus callosum. Those are what's gonna talk um, to each other, uh, you know, the, the hemispheres. Okay, and you can see that here. Make sure you know these, these are very good. Um, this is an MRI image right here, and you can see um, that this commercial fibers right here uh, go across, okay? Um, and the reason you could tell, see the, the on CTs, this bone would light up bright, but in MRIs, this is probably a T1-weighted MRI because um, you could see this, this is all lit up, this outside area, okay? Um, all right, and again, you can see. So these are fair games for, for second and third order questions on the test where they end up just pointing to a different area and you need to know that these commercial fibers cross in the corpus closed, okay? All right, and then projection fibers are gonna go from cortical to subcortical. So anything that has to come from the outside to the cerebral, cerebral cortex and go towards the basal ganglia or whatnot, um, that's what you're gonna use there or even go down through the brainstem. So the track that they use, the track you need to be intimately familiar with is this internal capsule, okay? And when you think about motor fibers, think about this. If you had some sort of lesion in this internal capsule, these are fibers, right? These would be classified as upper motor neuron fibers, right? So if you have some sort of lesion here, you would expect to see some sort of spastic paralysis on the other side, right? Okay, so that's a giveaway because they'll give you questions and, and you'll be like, well, where's the problem at? Well, if it's a problem with the cellular area here, you'll probably get some sort of flaccid paralysis, okay? Because it's not a track problem. But we said these white fibers, these white motor, these white neurons, particularly the motor neurons, uh, are gonna be upper motor neuron fibers, which we classify as spastic paralysis, okay? So that's a giveaway for internal capsule. But again, we'll get, we'll talk about that a little later too. Okay, so these projection fibers go out to end and in to out. All right. Um, okay. Let's see. Again, so you just need to kind of memorize these where everything goes. Pineal gland, of course, deals with your sleep, your circadian rhythm, pituitary gland, which you've learned in endocrine has all of your, a bunch of your hormones. And brainstem, uh, MV2 is gonna be a bunch about brainstem. This stuff, I don't know that you really need to know except for, well, you should know just in general, you won't get tested on it, but uh, whenever you look at a scan like this, uh, some sort of um, axial scan like this, um, remember the patient's feet are sticking out. Okay, that's why this is the left, that's why this is the right. The patient's feet always come out of the screen, their head's always back, okay, just like this. So you'd be looking at it from down here. Um, but that's how you orient yourself. And of course, as always, the midbrain has the Mickey Mouse. If you ever see the Mickey Mouse, you know you're in the midbrain, okay? Um, this is very important actually, uh, especially for MB2 when y'all do the cranial nerves, uh, especially in Haynes and the Atlas, they use this to, to show you what, um, what scan it is, okay? So when they used to do cross sections back in the day, they would always orient it like this, like you, you typically see your your um, your spinal your spinal uh, uh, your spinal cord, right? What you know, the butterfly. The ventral side's always at the bottom. The motor side, the, you know, the dorsal side, the sensory side's always at the top. But when they started doing these imaging scans for neurosurgeons to be able to do it, the neurosurgeons obviously found it much easier to look at it like this. Okay, so you have to be aware that when you're looking at these pictures which way is it flipped? So the rule basically is if you actually see, like if it's an actual scan, it's like this, okay? If it's some sort of cut section that's done in a lab, it's flipped. But Haynes, the Haynes Atlas, which y'all should look at, um, it has this to kind of just show you which one they're looking at, okay? But I remember that just being a pain trying to work that out, so. 
Um, all right, so these are just basic uh, definitions. Right, so you can look at this, and this is this is a cut section. This is not an actual scan. They cut, cut this and prepped it in the lab. So this is gonna be the ventral side. This will be the dorsal side. Um, always look for the cerebral aqueduct. See that there, so you know you're in the midbrain. Mickey Mouse is upside down in this picture. This is what I was showing y'all. You see the flip, right? So they'll show you both sides. Um, these would these little pictures that are blurry that honestly I never looked at because they were that blurry. Um, they, those will be your normal scans, okay? So you can see they're flipped in comparison. Okay, so if if you were like me, you just just use these, okay? Unless they you know, unless it's in a question stem, just know that if they actually show you an MRI that it's gonna be flipped the other way. All right. Um, and again, you really don't, this is gonna come back in, in B2. You really don't need to know too much of where you're at and location wise, because uh, what, what ends up happening, uh, the cranial nerves come off of the brain stem. So in, in B2, you're gonna to have to know kind of these landmarks. But for right now, I wouldn't stress about it too much. The main, the main thing, um, the main thing you need to know is that uh, about the brainstem is that remember the um, the DCML track and which we'll go through in a bit and the cortical spinal track are going to cross at the, the the base of the medulla right the lower aspect of the medulla, uh, which is the the very bottom of the brainstem and I'm going to draw it out for you guys when we get to it but. Uh, besides that, y'all are going to get into this in a lot more de detail in, uh, in B2. All right, and then our cerebellum, hey. of course. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, I was just want Anushka, can you like mute yourself? Because there's a lot of like feedback, so we can't really hear what Brady's saying. I don't know if she's there, but. Okay, let me see. I sorry. Can, I no, thank you, actually. I was, I was trying to do it. Okay, wait, I can. I think we're good. Nope. I just did it, Brady. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Okay. Um, yeah, so cerebellum, basically your fine motor movements, your proprioceptive movements. What does that mean? That means your your place in space, right? If you close your eyes and, and I, so they use this example and when they test proprioception or your place in space in um, clinically, right? So they tell the patient to sit on the side of the bed. They tell them to close their eyes and they take their big toe and they move it up or they move it down. Now, because their eyes are closed, they can't see, but what actually controls whether you can tell where your big toe is in space, whether it's up or whether it's down, is your cerebellum. That's the idea of uh, your area in space or where you are. Uh, another good example is called the Romberg test, okay? So they'll tell the patient to stand up and they have to close their eyes. And what happens is, if, even if you have a cerebellar problem, if you have your eyes open, you can still kind of stay oriented and not fall. But the second you close your eyes, it's very difficult to kind of keep yourself upright. So if there is a cerebellar lesion, if you take their vision away, uh, they tend to fall. So um, we joke about it because whenever you do the Romberg test, you kind of, as a doctor, have to like put your arms around the patient because the second they close their eyes, they kind of like drop, right? Because they can't orient themselves to space. Now, along with that, your vestibular cochlear apparatus helps with your balance too. But for whatever reason, by closing your eyes, you lose that main sense of like where you're actually at. So that's a big part of the cerebellum. Um, it's quite interesting how, you know, how that just is able to interact so well with the body and um, um, it's so important. All right, and we're getting to the lower aspect of the medulla. See the fourth ventricle. I, one of the things I would try to use, cause I find these, I find these difficult to like, when they start cutting these in slide, I try to find the ventricular system, like the cerebral aqueduct. If I could find it, I'm midbrain. If it, is, if it gets bigger, the fourth ventricle, I'm usually down lower in the, in the medulla, right? And then you can see these olivary complexes too. Uh, so we're right about the point, yeah, you can see here, right about the point where that's cortical spinal tracts cross over. And you can see that here, those are gonna cross over or decussate. Remember, anytime you hear the word decussate, that all that means is that they're crossing. All right. All right, now this is not terribly important either. So I'm just gonna kind of point out what they're gonna ask you on the exam. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Largest conductance, three and four. Okay, that's like FTM stuff. I don't know that they'll ask you that again. Um, there was one major thing um, yeah, so uh, the graded electrical uh, potential, meaning how far, if you sent an electrical signal, this is what I was talking about um, 
with the uh, with the uh, insulation with the uh, myelination, right? The more insulation you have, um, the larger it, or the larger the nerve is, the more linear of a uh, conduction you're going to get. So when what ends up happening? Picture. This is what ends up happening, right? So if you had a current right here. If you if you have it, if the nerve is not myelinated, it's if it's unmyelinated nerve, it, it some of the ele electricity, the energy gets lost as you go. Okay, so what do you do? What do you do to correct that? Well, you insulate the nerve just like electrical wires. Like you put insulation around it. You use a larger nerve so that the conduction, the path of least resistance, is still going to be down. Right? You don't want to lose all this electricity. That's not a very efficient process. So um, you want it to go straight down. So the larger the nerve you have, right, the greater radius, and the more insulation you have, the more the better of a conduction you're going to get. Now, let's use this practically. So the your pain and temperature, your ALS, right? Anytime you think ALS pain, and you should wake up in the middle of the night and just be like pain and temperature. They always go together. Now your pain and temperature when we were single cell organisms was still a very important process, right? These are very primitive fibers, right? Because even when we were amoebas, it was important to be able to, to avoid pain and avoid changes in temperature, okay? So this is why, for example, if you stub your toe, right? You know you have like a second before you're like, oh, this is gonna hurt, right? That's because those pain and temperature fibers, they're not myelinated, they're very slow. Okay, compared to such fibers such as vibration and proprioception, they're super fast because they're larger, they're myelinated. So when you think about that, you can uh, think that, for example, here, the length constant for pain and temperature, those primitive unmyelinated fibers is not gonna be very good, okay? Whereas some of the larger fibers um, that are myelinated are gonna have a greater length constant. What that means is it's gonna, the electrical impulse is gonna be able to travel further the length is gonna be better, okay? So just remember to get a good length, to get a good length constant or a good transmission, efficient transmission of electricity, you wanna have a larger nerve and you want it to be myelinated. And that's basically what this uh, is um, asking right here, okay? So that's basically all you need to get from this uh, process, okay? So you can see here, this is what I'm saying. This is what we want. We want a large nerve. We want a large cross-sectional area. We want a long length constant. We wanna lose as little of a, uh, electrical impulse or energy through this process as possible. The less we lose going out, the more that we're gonna get going downstream, which is what we want. Whereas here it's smaller, shorter, we're not getting a lot, okay? All right, um, just some sort of definitions, axon hillock, where it travels, right? Down the axon. Um, see, I don't remember any of this being tested, to be honest with you. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I'm pretty sure like 30% of our test was those like wild track questions, which is why uh, this is one of the few times I would recommend like going and getting an, uh, one of those question books and just doing a ton of questions. Um, it, was, it was pretty crazy. Um, but then again, uh, Kishore, who's a term below us, said they didn't have a ton of, ton of track questions. So, um, cause I warned them about it. I was like, go do all the track questions you could find. And he was like, we didn't have a ton. We had some, but not a ton. So who knows? But in, our, in my experience, we had a bunch. So I'd be prepared for it. All right, and we talked about this. The ones you really need to know about are Guillain-Barre um, and MS. Maybe vitamin B12, you know, you know, it's vitamin B12 deficiency and folate deficiency, you get macrocytic anemia. The way you can tell the difference is with vitamin B deficiency, you get um, demyelination. So you get neurologic problems. Okay. I don't know. That may be, if y'all haven't learned that, don't worry about it. But yeah, that's how you tell the difference between folate and B12. All right. And then anesthesia. Yeah. Y'all get into this a lot, a lot later. So don't stress that. All right, um, what is, what's that dude, he mapped them out. What's it called? What are the, the little, the one, like the different numbers? Oh, yeah, yeah. Broadman? uh, Broadman's, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, you should the know Broadman. the ones, yeah, Broadman's area. You should know the basic ones. Don't know them all, but know like uh, the, the, the motor cortex, the sensory, sensory is like one, two, and three. I don't really remember them. I think Wernicke's area is like 40 something. Um, yeah, just you just you just know the basic ones. I think it'll come up and it did. But if it doesn't, yeah. Um, 
And again, remember the what. The, so if we're looking at this, if you're trying to differentiate, remember in the, in the brain, gray matters on the outside that tracks the white matters on the inside, whereas in the spinal cord, white matters on the outside, cells are on the inside. All right, we talked about this. All right, here's a super important thing. And when we talk about the motor versus sensory cortex, it's gonna be even more important. This central sulcus is gonna separate um, the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. So your primary motor cortex from your primary sensory cortex, okay? So that's how you need to be, you need to be able to look at this and, and find the central sulcus because they're just gonna point to its point to one side of the central sulcus and, once, and, or in, and the other side. And they're gonna ask you, it's a, is it a motor problem or is it a sensory problem, okay? So the central sulcus uh, is important. As for the other ones, I'd say they're fair game, but they're low yield. But um, just in regards to this one, that one's super high yield to know. Uh, just in regard, because if you're talking about motor versus sensory issues, um, that's gonna be important. But we'll talk about that again in a little bit. All right, and then, yeah, I guess technically being able to differentiate um, uh, the, the different, like the, um, I think it's called like the lingual gyrus versus the other one. We'll talk about that too later, but yeah, because it's gonna differentiate whether you're talking about the upper portion of the eye and lower. So we're gonna do that in a bit, but um, um, yeah. So I, I would say medium yield, like knowing these, these gyruses, but uh, I'm sorry, these sulci. Um, but if it has a clinical significance, like such as motor versus sensory problems, consider that very high yield. Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, like this would be a good one. And the reason is because being able to differentiate which it's a cuneus versus lingual uh, and this calcarine uh, sulcus uh, will tell you what area of the eye is affected. Okay, so like if it ever comes across as something that has to do with something clinically, obviously consider that fair game. A different example here, like I don't know that there's anything super clinical about the different gyri right here. So even though they're easy to remember, I wouldn't say that's super high yield. Just knowing that Wernicke's area is over here in this parietal temporal junction. And uh, Broca's is obviously in the frontal lobe over here, but like I wouldn't call these high yield. Um, uncus, yeah, definitely know that this parahippocampal gyrus is actually the uncus, if, you, if that sounds familiar, when you get uncle herniations, that's a big problem. Uh, so if you get some sort of primarily like an epidural hematoma, because it's a high pressure hematoma or hemorrhage, uh, it's gonna push, push the brain downward. The only place you could go is through the frame and magnum. And when you do that, the first area that gets pinched is the oncus. Now what ends up happening is it pinches against that upper aspect of the midbrain. And when it does that, you have, uh, that's where your respiratory and um, your arousal center is. So you can go into a coma, go into respiratory arrest. So that oncus is gonna be um, like that first area for the uncle herniations. Um, yeah, right. So we're gonna, yeah, there we go primary auditory cortex is 41. So yeah, it kind of dives in there, but they, they circle it on the outside too, but it's kind of this whole little area right here. So again, that's where, that's your input. I differentiate Wernicke's area from Broca's area as input versus output, right? Wernicke's area is anything you hear, Broca's er area is anything you speak. So if you wanna talk about it clinically, if, a pro if uh, you're talking to a person that has a stroke and they're able to communicate with you, but when you talk, they just don't act, they don't get it, that's an input problem. So it's a Wernicke's problem. If they hear you and it seems like they understand, but they start talking gibberish, that means it's a Broca's problem. One of the interesting things that they do like to test on is, remember I mentioned uh, that those fibers that come across, those arcuate fibers. So those connect Wernicke's area to Broca's area. You can actually tell if they have a problem in the actual arcuate fasciculus, these, these connection fibers. What you actually ask the patient to do is to say, repeat after me. And if the patient isn't able to repeat what you say, that's, that's a problem in the transmission between Wernicke's to Broca's. So they like to test on that because they'll, be, they'll ask you, get the patient to repeat after me, where's the lesion, right? They can't. So it's, it's that, that their inability to communicate from Wernicke's to Broca's. Okay, and uh, in real life, it's really much more complex than that, but that's all they really test you on. And insular lobe, okay, so here it is, yeah. Um, Interoception, that's like autonomic functions. Yeah, they won't touch on that, but taste, which is gustatory, uh, and then some sort of you know, some visceral sensations are there. So not super, not super high yield. 
All right. Again, I wouldn't call these these sulci like something you really need to know because there's not, not not really a lot of clinical differentiation between them. But again, that central sulcus is going to be super important. Yeah, see, I wouldn't bother with stuff like that. I know y'all did that in your small groups and stuff, but yeah. Right, so, okay, this is super important, right? Because they'll give you this view. Um, so what you actually do, because they're gonna ask you, is it a motor problem or is it a sensory problem? And so the central sulcus is actually right here. Now, the way you can tell is you follow this S like this up, right? Did, I forget the name of this sulcus. If somebody knows it, they could, they could say it. Um, but you follow this, this up like this, and this separates the motor area from the sensory. So if you remember the homunculus, this area here is gonna be like the leg and the genitals, right? over here. So they'll ask you, they'll say somebody has some sort of motor leg problem and they'll give you this view and ask you and it'll be over here. But I used to get confused whether it was like this little thingy right here or this one. But the trick is to follow this sulci, whatever it's called up. And uh, that's how you can tell where the difference between the uh, motor and sensor area is. Oh, here we go. Here's Brotman's areas. Okay, so know these. If you know these, you should be fine. Yeah. These, yeah, basic same thing. Uh, what's it called? Singulate sulcus. That's it. Follow that one up, and you kind of see. Um, it does. Okay, shoot. Um, so they're saying. Okay, I'm sorry. Maybe I had that wrong. Shoot, I need to double check it because I I think I've seen it differently. Okay, I'm sorry. According to this, uh, the, the central sulcus is that little thing. I apologize. Right here. Um, yeah, um, you're right. The thing is, you just follow the um, cingulate circuit, cingulate uh, sulcus, and it's like one anterior okay. to the hot dust. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for correcting me. All right, so yes, it is this little notch right here on the inside. That's the um, the central sulcus, the end of it. And so, if you do it like that, follow that up, and then it's one prior to it. Okay, so um, ideally, they they won't point in this little area here but if they do that's still sensory for some i can't remember what happened okay yeah so let me just mention again i apologize for that uh follow the cingulate sulcus up and then it's one prior to it so that will separate you know it's just not a clear delineation right it did you know between the gyri it kind of splits so uh for whatever reason just go with what the notes say so central sulcus here so anything posterior to that is going to be um, sensory. Yeah. All right, and then of course the olfactory bulbs are down here. You can see that, not a lot of testable material uh, for that right now. And then you can see here, uh, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, um, and of course our central sulcus. Yeah, and then differentiating these, I don't know that that's super important either at the moment. Once y'all do the dementias uh, later on, that'll get more important. Um, all right, cingulate gyrus, obviously it's your limbic system, your emotional cortex. And they could ask you this, I guess, just the different areas when they talk about the corpus callosum and these fibers. Okay. And then again, I know y'all covered all this in small group in like detail, but um, it's not super testable. All right. And then the ventricles. Yeah, y'all know these by now. The two, um, the lateral ventricles drain into the third interventricular foramen, third ventricle. You can see this cerebral aqueduct here to the fourth ventricle down here. Yeah. So unfortunately, a lot of this is just uh, just memorization. All right, and we're gonna get, they're just touching on this, but we'll get to the tracks in a little bit. All right, and then when we talk about 
yeah the um yeah this is like more renal stuff i don't really need to know the distribution but um yeah i guess the ventricular systems in regards to the different types of hydrocephalus you definitely need to know those um yeah you wouldn't expect to have L or well you get decreased glucose if you have some sort of bacterial infection in this in the uh csf and then decreased protein content as well and y'all know this by now the conus medullaris is going to be uh where the end of the the um, uh, the spinal cord is, and then you have the cauda caud equina, right? So if you do a, a lumbar puncture, L3, L4 in adults, that's what you need to know. And then of course, in, any type of intracranial pressure, this is what you would expect clinically, uh, which is weird. Remember bradycardia, why is that? Oh shoot, hold on, I need to charge mine. Give me one second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, right, so uh, a papilledema makes sense, increasing the pre intracranial pressure. If it's bad enough, it can kind of make the eye stick out a little bit. Nausea makes sense. That um, area postrema is affected. Uh, increased blood pressure as well. That could actually be the cause of the incre increased intracranial pressure. But bradycardia is a weird one, but just remember that uh, that area of the, of the midbrain uh, that controls your respirations. If it's if it has a lot of pressure on it, it can end up leading to bradycardia. So that's kind of the weird one that sticks out when we talk about this. Um. Okay. So put a star on this slide. I don't know why they felt like they needed to talk to test on this, but they do. Um, just kind of basically remember what goes with what. So increased lipid solubility means uh, the more lipophilic it is the easier it can cross the membrane. Remember, charged stuff doesn't cross through membranes, okay? So if it diazepam is um, is a anti-anxiolytic, um, anti-anxiety medication. So stuff like that easily can go across. And then stuff over here, these osmotic agents uh, typically don't go across. They just pull fluid into the vasculature. But you do need to know things that don't fall on this line, um, such as glucose or L-DOPA, it's because they have some sort of other sort of transporter. So fair game, they could ask you this. Just remember as you go to the right, they're more liquid soluble. And you've kind of learned about these different um, transporters by now. Right, um, well, we'll get to the uh, different hydrocephalus in a second. Right, and they're just touching on this. So just remember uh, any sort of, remember if bacteria is in the CN, is in the CNS, is in the CSF, right? It's like a meningitis, stuff like that, or some sort of um, uh, CSF infection. Uh, the bacteria have to eat glucose. So if glucose is ever decreased, that means there's a bacterial infection. Sometimes it could be fungal, but that, those are weird infections. So anytime you see decreased glucose, think bacterial infection. Viruses tend to use T cells, lymphocytes, uh, so that's when you go with that. But of course the glucose is normal because the viruses aren't eating glucose, okay? And any sort of infection can end up with increased protein, okay? There's more stuff in there, so there's more protein. All right, so this is just an intro, but y'all know this by the bet, you know, term three stuff. All right, and then definitely know this. Of course, we see the, the uh, lateral ventricles drain to the third ventricle, foramen of Monroe, AKA intraventricular foramen through that cerebral aqueduct down to the fourth ventricle and the foramen of Mingenti and Lushka, uh, bring it to the spinal cord. So if you have any sort of blockage, you're worried about uh, uh, non-communicating hydrocephalus, right? Like we see here, so cerebral aqueduct. Um, so anything proximal to that, anything that's draining into it can get dilated, right? Because you're gonna have increased intracranial pressure, you're gonna get a backlog of of fluid uh, there. So that's what you would expect to see. That's that's why it's non-communicating. It's not traveling through to here. So this is an obstruction, okay? 
So what would you expect? You would expect symptoms of increased intracranial pressure, papilledema, headaches, bradycardia, uh, problems with vision. Um, and you can see that here, unfortunately. Um, uh, of course, in, in infants, those, um, those uh, sulci are, shoot, um, the cranial sutures aren't, uh, aren't um, fused. So of course, in, in, in any increase in intracranial pressure can cause separation and it'll cause um, the head to grow or the, the cranium to expand. All right, hydrocephalus ex vacuole. What they talk about here, don't get this confused with normal pressure hydrocephalus, okay? Hydrocephalus ex vacuole tends to happen in the elderly. What happens is you get degeneration, you get atrophy of the brain as you get older, you have to fill the space with something. So you fill it with CSF, okay? So this is just an age-related process. Now, um, well, we'll get to it in a second. Communicating hydrocephalus typically means you're either making too much CSF or you can't get rid of it. So it is absorbed through the superior sagittal uh, sinus and drained into the venous system. So if you have a problem there, a lot of times it's not, like if you had a previous infection and you had fibrosis of this area, sometimes the, the fluid can't, the CSF can't get in there, right? So you get a backup of, of, of CSF. So it's not technically like a non-communicating where you have a blockage, you just can't reabsorb it. Now, also some sort of ependiomas, some sort of um, um, you know, cancer of the, the choroid plexus can cause um, increased secretion of CSF. So if that's the case, that can also cause a communicating hydrocephalus, which you would expect to see is enlargement of these ventricles, okay? Now, normal pressor hydrocephalus. There is a triad. If you don't have the triad, you can't have normal, this is, yeah, normal pressure hydrocephalus. Okay, what's the triad? Uh, shit. <laughs> um, it's um, ataxia, um, urinary incontinence, and what's the other one? Somebody help me out. Phone Wet, a wacky, wobbly. Thanks, Lindsay. <laughs> Everyone's winning in the chat, so I thought I'd help you out. Con confusion, <laughs> right? Ata confusion, ataxia, urinary incontinence. Okay, <laughs> wet, wacky, well. Thank you, guys. I'm wacky and wobbly. All right. Um, right, so that if you don't have all three, it's not normal press or hydrocephalus. If you do, then it is. So just make sure on this question, Sam, all three are there. They have to give you all three. All right, because if you have two, that could be something else. It has to be all three. All right. Good, good. Uh, yeah, we talked about this, blood blame barrier, right? Astrocytes typically handle that. Blood CSF barrier, the ependymal cells. Mm. And then different sorts of edema, it could be an extracellular problem, or yeah, extracellular problem. So any sort of vascular problem, some sort of increased permeability uh, can, all of the extra fluid can go from the vasculature to the brain, or you can get cyt cytotoxic insult, you can get necrosis of the cells in the brain and then you get release of or cellular swelling in that case, okay? So makes sense, it's just like any other area of the body, either the fluid's coming from the vessels or it's coming from the actual cells that likes, okay? So just knowing the differences there, this is very much intro for you guys. Once you get to some of the pathology of the brain that gets a little bit more intense. Whoops, what I do, there we go. What's this? All right, meninges. So when we talk about this, by all means, you have to know the story for the different um, hematomas or hemorrhages, okay? So we'll go through them. So knowing it, remember dura means tough mother, dura mater, dura mater. Um, so it is literally pressed up against the periosteum of the bone, okay? It's kind of glued on there, but it's very tough. Arachnoid matter is in between and the pia matter is literally, it's like, it's, it's, like, like visqueen on top of the brain, right? You can't exactly peel it off. It goes right on top of the brain. Now, what's important is you see some of these vessels here, right? These are, what are what's gonna rupture. So for this, this meningeal artery, you know, that's the epidural hematoma, right? What does that mean? That means you're gonna get high pressure blood from the artery in between the periosteum and the dura, okay? So that's why it makes that, that high pressure bicon Vex, pancake, convex, yes, like a lens, convex disc, okay? So we'll go through those and we'll just do the story for each of them. All right, so what's the story? Young guy playing sports, gets hit on the side of the head, knocked out, 
wakes up, says he feels fine. About two hours later, he passes out, right? Traumatic event, got hit on the side of the head. Um, what happened? Ruptured meningeal artery, okay? So initially he got concussed or whatever. Ruptured, you know, it's at that pterion, the men middle meningeal artery. It's a bad place because it's a weak point in the skull. Um, so he gets hit there, middle meningeal artery ruptures. He gets knocked out, um, wakes up because he feels fine for a while, but all, the, all, all during that time, that high pressure, that arterial system, high pressure blood flow is, is getting, uh, is peeling the dura off of the periosteum, okay? So it's very important. That's a fourth order question. It's saying what happened, you know, you know it's epidural hematoma, but then they're gonna ask, well, where's the blood? You need to know it's in between the periosteum, that bony layer, and the dura, okay? High pressure system. Remember that lucid interval. They always say, they wake up and say, no, I'm fine, I'm good. And then uh, by the point when it gets like this, you're starting to have that uncle herniation. So then they drop out. Um, biconvex, another very important point, because this is actually between the periosteum and the dura, um, it will not cross suture lines, okay? These are the suture lines right about here. This is limited to this dura attached to this periosteum of this bone, of this temporal bone right here. So it will not cross suture lines. That's a very important point when you're differentiating it from a uh, subarachnoid hematoma or hemorrhage. All right, now, what's the story here? Elderly patient may or may not have had trauma, maybe bumped their head two, three weeks ago, okay? No big deal, and then all of a sudden, uh, a couple of weeks later, they start getting confused. They start getting irritated, uh, may or may not even so show signs of this until it gets bad. Now, you can see here, this is rupture of the bridging veins. Now, why did these bridging veins rupture in elderly? That's because their brain starts to atrophy and these bridging veins start to stretch. So the brain has a little bit more wiggle room. They, it may not even be a bad trauma. They may not even remember the trauma, right? But all of a sudden, these bridging veins kind of break. Now, why does it take longer? Well, because they're veins, not arteries, right? So it takes longer for this blood to, uh, to, um, to collect, right? Now, what's the question? Well, where's the blood collecting? Well, it's subdural. So it's in between the dural, it's under the dura and above the arachnoid, okay? So you can see that here. Now, what's important about that is because it's not close to the bone, it can cross the suture lines. Look how big this is, all right? So look how all the way across, right? Let me go back to the other one. You see how it's confined here? High pressure, right? You're making this uh, biconvex disc, that lens shape, versus this. Uh, it's all like this, and it's more like a crescent or a moon shape, right? That's because we're below the bone, okay? So longer time course, elderly, due to that brain atrophy, ruptured dural veins, or these bridging veins, they call it, okay? So that's super important. Now, um, subarachnoid hemorrhage. This tends to happen in people that have uh, prolonged hypertension, okay? Um, typically, they have an aneurysm first, so a ballooning of the vessel. And once you have an aneurysm or this ballooning of the vessel, the walls of the vessel become weak. If the walls are weak, eventually they're gonna rupture, okay? So whenever you hear, this is, when you hear of a, a heart attack patient, they always come in and say, it feels like an elephant sitting on my chest, right? Immediately in the stem of the question, you know they had a heart attack. For this, they talk up, they'll, the patient comes in and they say, it was like a thunderclap headache. It was like, boom, right? And they say, this is the worst headache of my life. That's, that's classic for subarachnoid hemorrhage. You better get into the neurosurgeon quick, right? They don't have a lot of time, okay? So you can see this here. Photophobia is a big thing. Uh, blood will collect in the sulci, right? Now, that, that's a big differential, right? When we had our disc, our biconvex disc or a crescent-shaped disc, we weren't collecting blood in the sulci. Now, the reason that is, is because this is subarachnoid. This is below the arachnoid and above the pia. So again, this allows the blood to collect in these sulci. Again, this tends to happen after an aneurysm, prolonged hypertension. Uh, you can even get neck pain because of the, the pressure on the meninges, okay? So um, yeah, be aware of that. Now, you can also get... Um, intracerebral, right? So this is even below the pia matter. This is like uh, in the parenchyma, right? The cellular structure of the brain. So you're talking about some of these watershed areas of this lenticular striate arteries. These are very small. Look at these areas here. But what you can see is you, you wouldn't necessarily see these as collecting in the sulci, right? This is more, more ventricular blood, this white blood that you see here. Um, so it looks like there was a little rupture in this little, one of those little arteries there. But again, these are very small, fragile arteries. So if these rupture, 
that could bleed directly into the brain. Okay, so you just need to be able to differentiate this from subarachnoid. Um, but these are tend to be smaller. They do have hypertension. Obviously, that's going to be a problem for a lot of these, um, and it can cause hydrocephalus, right? But that's a blood problem, not necessarily a CSF. So, um, so yeah. So just be be aware: subarachnoid versus intracerebral. Okay, subarachnoid is quick, aneurysm based, thunderclap headache, whereas intracerebral can be a smaller infarct of one of the uh, smaller branching arteries here. All right, this is a pain for everybody. You gotta know it, you just gotta know it, especially for NB2, y'all will know this. Um, so we're tracking the, the front aspect here of the brainstem, okay? Like if you're looking at this right, right here. So we see our basilar arteries come together. They branch to our vertebral, art. I'm sorry, our vertebral arteries that come together to get to our basilar arteries. We have our superior cerebellar, our posterior cerebral, and then we have the circle of Willis joins up with the carotid. Uh, and then we have the circle of Willis comes around here and you have our anterior cerebral. Now, when y'all get to NB2, it's gonna be more important because when you have injuries to specific arteries, these branch points, it's gonna affect some of the cranial nerves, okay? So when you talk about the pica and the ica here, um, the way I remember it is the pica comes off of the vertebral, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, the ica comes off of the basilar, okay? Then you work your way up. The next one is superior cerebellar, right? So we're done with our cerebellars, and then we go to the cerebral. Larger one here, posterior cerebral, and then you make your circle, okay? Um, you need to know it on this picture diagram. You need to be able to identify it on angiograms. The angiograms are tough. The first goal of the angiogram is to, let's see if we have one. Um, Okay, well, the first goal, we'll come across it, but I'll just tell you now. The first goal of the angiogram is to identify, are we coming from the carotid or are we coming from the vertebrals to the basilar? Okay, because de by defining that, you can tell the branch points better. Um, but some of the angiograms are easily are labeled, are labeled better, but some of them, some of the, uh, the dye gets into the other structures, so they're tough to identify. So you need to be able to identify whether it's the carotid or the vertebral. But if we come across one, I'll walk through it with you guys. All right, so our, our peduncle, our, yeah, not peduncle, <laughs> our homunculus, right? So you know this now, they love testing on it. Go to first aid and look at it, um, but it'll show you where everything comes from right, the, the trunk and arm, and then the hand has a lot of space in the brain because you have fine touch, right? You can identify pinpoint sensation and motor movements of your hand much better than on your back. So your hand actually takes up much more space than your back. That's why if you look at that homunculus, the hand's really big. The face is really big because you get a lot of fine touch on the face as well. Okay, so you need to know where these fall on the brain. It's very important because again, they could tell you somebody has facial weakness and they could point to the area of the brain. They're gonna want you to know which side of the central sulcus you're on. And they're gonna want you to know if it's a motor sensory problem, is it of the face and it's kind of lower down, right? So you need to practice with these. I would recommend first aid for sure. Um, can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. Uh, can you like just give a quick example? When is it like the motor problem and when is it like somatosensory? Sometimes it's like get mixed up. Sure. So any sort of paralysis or weakness is going to be a motor motor problem. Any tort, any sort of uh, numbness, tingling, or or just in, uh, or just in inability to to feel anything is going to be a sensory problem. Yeah, but mm -hmm. sometimes you, sometimes there's crossover. Sometimes you have an injury that affects motor and sensory. You know, so um, it just depends. But uh, I know a lot of the problems encompass both. Yeah. All right. And then obviously the vasculature is important too. This middle cerebral artery is gonna do a ton of work over here. So basically everything from the trunk to the arm to the face, that derivation sensory and motor is gonna come middle cerebral. But they love testing on the fact that if you have some sort of leg weakness or loss of sensation of your leg, uh, that's a problem with the anterior cerebral artery. The anterior cerebral artery uh, I guess that's the best picture they had. Look, the anterior cerebral artery does the whole middle right here. So if we find our central sulcus, which would be 
can get it right this time, right here. Um, so the leg and the genitals is, is, is gonna be from the anterior cerebral artery. So don't just assume the whole homunculus comes from middle. When you talk about the medial aspect of the brain, anterior cerebral is what you're worried about. Again, this just takes practice. All right. And I think this was a DLA, but we kind of talked about the venture force. I think y'all are good. Okay. Development fun. Okay. Let's see. This is, you just need to memorize these, what these different um, precursors do, right? Like things such as holoprosencephaly, that's usually a problem with Sonic Hedgehog gene. Right, I think, I don't know if y'all play the game, Sonic Hedgehog, he's got a mohawk. I think of that as holoprosencephaly, separating it. If you don't have that, you get one hemisphere of the brain. Um, but uh, yeah, like I put, obviously I made these in red. These are just definition, right? So EMX specific to schizencephaly. I think they have a picture of schizencephaly. Like most of the brain doesn't form in that. Um, but you just need to memorize what, yeah, look at that. They'll give, they can give you a picture of this and be like, what's the gene involved? So, you know, this is schizencephaly, it's EMX. Okay, so unfortunately this is very out, outside of a lot of clinical medicine, but you just need to memorize uh, how these develop. Dandy Walker syndrome, you don't get the cere cerebellum doesn't develop, okay? Cerebellar problem. But I wouldn't spend too much time looking at this stuff. I know it was very confusing for me. And we'll talk about the eyes in a bit. Uh, that synaptic, what is that called? Pruning, yeah. It just, it basically just means there's a bunch of crossover when you're a kid and you need to be able to see your vision in, or, uh, in different ways. And, and um, so you basically are able to prune it to where this part does this part and this part does that part. That's basically it in layman's term. Yeah, this, is, this was so out of, out of left field. I don't even know if I would even bother with it to be honest with you. All right, um, I'd give y'all a break, but I'm, I'm, I have to get somewhere. So we're just gonna keep going. All right, so uh, synaptic transmission, doo -doo -doo -doo. I don't even know if they'll test you on this. Yeah, I mean, y'all remember this, uh, ionotropes, right? So this is like different sorts of receptors, acetylcholine receptors versus metatropes. Um, right, muscarinic, so your G-protein coupled receptors. It's kind of been a while, but I don't, I don't remember them testing too much on that. Quantal size versus quantal content. This was confusing for me as well. Um, think of, wait, let me make sure I get this right. Right, so the size are the transmitters that are in the vesicle, right? So, and then the content is how many vesicles are released. So size or size of the, or, or the number of transmitters inside the vesicle and content are how many vesicles are released. So size comes before content, just in case they ask you that. Um, these are good to know. I put these in red, um, just knowing a basic definition of what, what, um, what toxin does what, okay? And what are the side effects for that? So botulism, everybody knows that, Botox. If you prevent acetylcholine release, you get um, flaccid paralysis, right? And then some of these other ones are gonna be important to know. Tetanus is the opposite of, of, of Botox or botulism toxin where you get uh, spastic paralysis, you get tetanus, tetany, right? Okay, um, just make a note to know this one. I think they, there was something about that. Maybe it was just a practice question, but it is a, a potassium channel blocker. Um, yeah. And then did they talk about, there it is. Yeah, all right, right. So yeah, Lambert-Eaton syndrome, right? So it's basically the opposite of myasthenia gravis. Whereas with myasthenia gravis, you get weakness with repetitive movement, Lambert-Eaton syndrome, you get more strength. Now, the reason is similar in that you get autoantibodies, right? Remember with myasthenia gravis, you get autoantibodies to the postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors. With Lambert-Eaton syndrome, you get autoantibodies to the presynaptic calcium receptors. So the point is with repetitive movement, you're just kind of like shooting out a little bit of calcium at a time, right? You should shoot a lot, but you have uh, these autoantibodies against the, 
the calcium channels. So the point is with repetitive movement, eventually you get enough calcium to get a strong muscle contraction. Okay, it just takes time. So just kind of, I, I just try to keep them opposite uh, Lambert Eaton and, um, and myasthenia gravis. But yeah, you could put this down. It's a potassium channel blocker that works with this as well. Okay, spatial versus temporal, that should make, spin, make sense. Any sort of electrical impulse that is that you go through um, through space, right? So if you have multiple, you know, touch points, right? That you're touching at different areas, but at the same time, temporal just means time. So it's a single impulse over time, okay? So you can summate that either way. Spatially, you could put them together and know if you, if you add them together, you get, you're getting multiple impulses. Whereas time, um, you can still do that with repetition. And then, yeah, y'all know this by now. Um, these will recycle neurotransmitters or break them down, monoamine oxidase and COMT. Um, I think Dr. Mpadia had her own lecture on this, or maybe this was it. Um, but you know, these will break down your norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. A little bit of the same stuff. Of course, yeah, so um, this is the area they talk about if they ever talk about this area, the nucleus basalis of Maynard. Uh, that deals with Alzheimer's. Okay, Alzheimer's is kind of global, but this is the area specifically that they, they use on autopsy for diagnostic purposes, okay? Um, and this goes into myasthenia gravis, which we kind of talked about. Again, those postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors. So if you keep moving, eventually um, you're gonna flood them, right? And you're, you're not gonna be able to uh, have, generate an impulse. So these people, tend to get tired over time. They get weakness throughout the day. They get ptosis of the eye. Uh, eventually it can lead into respiratory failure and stuff like that. Okay, GABA and glutamate. You know, GABA in the CNS is a positive neurotransmitter. GABA is a negative. So things like anti-anxiety medications, tend, they tend to use GABA. They upregulate GABA because it helps to downregulate your, um, your, the, the nervous system, right? Kind of calm you down a little bit. All right, and just knowing ionotropic would deal with, remember NMDA is glutamate. It's a glutamate receptor, glutamate binding. It's ionotropic versus metabotropic. Let's see here, not super high yield. Okay, so this should make sense. If someone's having seizures, they're releasing too much glutamate. That's what's giving that positive impulse, too much positive impulse. So if you give NMDA glutamate uh, receptor antagonist, um, you can suppress the seizures, okay? In conjunction with that, you can give uh, some uh, GABA, uh, such as benzodiazepines, they use for anxiety, they also use those for seizures. So if you upregulate GABA, that's kind of similar to uh, downregulating down -regulate, down glutamate. Yeah, you can see here, use benzos. And glycine is similar to GABA, it is, um, a negative regulator. Uh, one thing they liked to test on, I put it in red here, is this strychnine. Okay, so this is this will block glycine. Okay, it's an inhibitory interneuron. So you'll see this in the PNS as well. And you see this strychnine poisoning. They did test this on this. All right. And y'all know this pathway by now. Y'all showed the tyrosine all the way to epinephrine pathway. Remember, COMT and uh, myomine oxidase will um, break those down. And then when we talk about dopamine, y'all will get into this a lot more when y'all get to NB3 and y'all talk about schizophrenia. But dopamine has multiple pathways. You have your movement pathway uh, that deals with Parkinson's. Also, of course, everybody knows dopamine is uh, vital in your emotional well-being, your, um, um, your reward center of the, the brain. Uh, as well, so your substantia nigra, and then some of these other areas as well. So for all the, all of these reward, mood, and movement all have to do with dopamine. So some of the movement issues you can get Parkinsonian problems. Um, D one technically is a positive dopamine signal. D two is a negative dopamine signal. 
it gets very confusing very fast when you start looking at these but it's not it's not very it's, it's not a concept that's very testable um, it's not really clinically relevant unless you bring parkinson's into it um, which everybody has a, a general understanding about all right, so reticular formation is like your arousal center of the brain. Of course, you need catecholamines to help you wake up. Um, locus ceruleus is not tested uh, very much, but it has emotional, uh, um, um, it deals with your emotions. It also has to do with neuroplasticity and stuff like that, but it's not super important. Mm. And then of course, serotonin, very similarly, uh, helps with regulate your mood as well. First line drug for depression, which I will get to in NB3 uh, is um, serotonin agonists, right? Right, okay. Yeah, so definitely know this one. I know that was kind of off the wall in this church meeting, but um, if it inhibits glycine, um, you won't get muscle rigor, right? Or tetany. Or you will, I'm sorry, it will block the positive glycine. So you, you, if strictly, you will get muscle rigidity. Wait, hold on. Okay, yeah, that right, that's right. Okay. Um, maybe that, yeah, this is Dr. Pogges. So this kind of just goes into the different pathways. Most of this should be reviewed. Remember, POMC is the precursor to uh, ACTH and uh, melatonin, not melatonin, melanin, right? So, um, uh, yeah. Um, okay. Opioids, beta endorphins are involved as well. I just, this wasn't super high yield for us. Um, Y'all did this in um, DM as well. The neurotransmitters, the transport of nitrogens. And then this GABA shunt, which is something that comes in, um, it helps to get into the TCA. Oh, oh, oh I see, with alpha ketoglutarate. Yeah, ah, shoot. I feel like I remember her talking about it, but I can't remember the question on the exam. Um, but I, the point you want to be able to um, um, recycle it, right? So you go through this GABA shunt to recycle um, and get back to glutamate. Then glutamine synthase is a super important enzyme there. Right, and you can see this process. Yeah, that's the shunt. Okay, so unfortunately, a lot of this is just memorization. But again, I'm telling y'all, like a lot of our tests, I was surprised at how focused it was on those tracks. So um, yeah, PCP, we know uh, they talk about uh, patients that come in belligerent. It's an antagonist of these glutamate receptors. So um, that's what gives them that feeling of like dominance or um, yeah, or disinhibition. And you can see here, glutamate can be, can be formed into GABA, which is why you need that GABA shunt because you need to be able to reform it back to glutamate. Okay, so um, these are some of the pathways that are, that are involved. Glutamate decarboxylase, right? That's how you get it. PLP is precursor um, and you can make GABA. Then when GABA is recycled back to glutamate, that's when you use the GABA shunt. You feed it back into alpha ketoglutarate in the Klebs cycle in this glial cell on the outside, and then you can get glutamine back, all right? So um, uh, glutamate and GABA are intimately um, involved, right? Because of the positive negative effect, right? You need to have equal, equal and opposite. All right, and then these GABA, again, the main thing about GABA is when you use benzodiazepines, which is Valium, barbiturates even, they don't use that that much anymore, but benzodiazepines reduce anxiety. They help to upregulate the GABA. Um, the GABA receptor, right? So you give benzodiazepine, it makes the GABA receptor open longer or more frequently and chloride can go in and that helps to give a negative impulse to the CNS to help calm things down. And this is just same thing, a different form. 
All right, and we know ammonia is very toxic to the body. Uh, it gets stored as urea, which is great in the liver because you can pee it out in the kidneys if you don't have kidney failure. Um, but that's what builds up in kidney failure. So ideally you're able to get rid of the urea. If you can't, you build up ammonia, it, you have to store it somehow. It's stored as glutamate, it's and eventually stored as, stored as glutamine in the brain. And that can end up causing um, um, uh, cerebral edema, right? Because that, that it's an osmotic agent. So all of that ammonia that builds up as glutamine brings water back and you end up with cerebral edema. So ammonia is very toxic to the brain. You need to be able to get rid of it. And then again, as always start on the slide when we want to talk about clinical aspects, that's what they're going to test on. Okay. And then this is not super important. You know, homocysteine is very toxic as well. You need B12 to get rid of it. Um, uh, to get, yeah, and also folate as well, tetrahydrofolate. And then, of course, oh, I'm surprised y'all talked about this earlier. Okay, I'll touch on it. So Parkinson's, you want dopamine, all right? You want to get more dopamine because it's substantia nigra. Those neurons die, so you can't get dopamine, uh, and that's why they get movement disorders. The problem is when you give L-dopa, which is the form of dopamine precursor to it, it is degraded in the peripheral nervous system. So they figured out that they could give something along with L-dopa, they can give carbidopa. Carbidopa helps prevent the breakdown of L-dopa in the peripheral nervous system. Now, carbidopa doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, but it allows L-dopa to get into the CNS without getting degraded, okay? So then L-dopa gets into the brain where it needs to be. Carbidopa stays outside of the PNS and, um, and the L-dopa is allowed to break down. You get increased dopamine to the brain, which helps with Parkinsonian symptoms, okay? And you can see here, Serotonin is not broken down by COMT. It's only broken down by MAO. The breakdown product, if you have any sort of serotonin syndrome or excess serotonin, you will find this in the urine by uh, HIAA, okay? Y'all know about this, thymine deficiency. You can lead to Wernicke, sy uh, Wernicke symptoms. You get confusion, um, ophthalmoplegia or blurry vision and ataxia as well. Um, and then it could uh, it can progress to Korsakoff symptoms where you get those confabulations, you lose anterior grade, you have an anterior grade amnesia. So you, you're telling stories that you truly believe are true, but they're not because your brain, you lose a lot of the neuronal connections. Okay, but this is, deals with vitamin B12 deficiency, I'm sorry, vitamin B1. And if you remember back from all the way back in DM, um, we took, wait, y'all just did DM. It's been a long time for me, sorry. Um, TLC for Nancy, right? Remember those, those uh, needed with the T is for thymine, right? So that B1. Um, so these complexes can't fully uh, go through the process, the Krebs cycle, the, um, the odd chain fatty acids can't be broken down. So eventually you get this Wernicke Korsakoff uh, syndrome, which is highly tested. Okay, great. All right. Now, we will talk about finally. All right, well, before we get to the tracks, right? You just kind of need to know, uh, well, these are the tracks. Yeah, but wait, they talked about before. Um, okay, we'll go with this. All right, so you're breaking things down. Remember, when you think about this, temperature and pain are very primitive of an impulse. Again, like I said, stubbing your toe, it's unmyelinated fiber, this is primitive. Whereas these are very complex, discriminative touch. That means two point discrimination, right? If you touch yourself in two different places, you could tell that it's two fingers, not just one. Vibration, a very complex uh, impulse, right? You're being able to differentiate multiple impulses at the same time and kind of uh, discriminate against them and proprioception, your, your, um, your, where you are in space. Okay. So these are very complex versus these are very simple and primitive. Okay. So separate them. These tracks go to the brain through the anterior lateral system, the ALS, also called the spinal thalamic tract. Okay. So they do use these interchangeably. Whereas these go through the DCML. Now, it is the dorsal column until it crosses over until uh, at the base of the brainstem. 
that's a great trick when you're answering these, okay? So the, it is the dorsal column. As soon as it decussates and crosses over, it is then called the medial lemniscus. So you need to use those words and you can answer questions properly uh, by knowing that because they'll, they'll give you that. And if they say it's medial lemniscus, you know it's crossed already, okay? Where dorsal column, it hasn't crossed yet. Okay, this is what I was gonna say before. This is just, I don't remember these, um, just basic definitions, right? And Sinian has to do with vibration, I believe. Um, so just go through and memorize these, be fine. Um, and then there's a, a lecture coming up and we'll go through the reflexes in a bit. All right, so this is what we're talking about. Remember, I said, look at the pain and temperature. They're unmyelinated, they're C fibers, they're very slow. That's why it takes time for that pain impulse to get from your stubbed big toe to your head, right? Whereas these are myelinated in different, um, different areas. So some, some of the painted temperatures have a little bit of myelin, you can see that here, but you can see that DCML tract, they're heavily myelinated, okay? Those are fast, those are very complex impulses, okay? Um, yep, you've learned this a million times. If you get that you, shingles, that react activation of, uh, of herpes, of uh, HSV or herpes zoster, um, it, it's, it's, um, it's latent, it stays latent in the dorsal root ganglion. If you're immunocompromised, elderly patients, it can get reactivated. You get that dermatomal distribution, unilateral side, um, uh, uh, that like rash that forms. Okay, so easy points. All right. Um, right, so dorsal columns are up here, right? We, we need to orient ourselves. We know ventral is motor, dorsal is sensory. So these dorsal columns run up here. So the touch, vibration, and proprioception are up here. They will run in this track until you get to the base of the brainstem. As soon as you get to the base of the brainstem, the bottom of the medulla, that's when they cross over, okay? And you can see here, the leg is toward the inside. I just remember this because your leg's closer to your midline than your arm, right? So leg, arm, and this is the fascic, or the gracil, gracil, the cuneate and the gracil fasciculus, okay? So probably uh, important to know. Set. Yes. You said something. Uh, sorry, I'm confusing again. Uh, the no ALS is motor, right? ALS, ALS is uh, your pain and temperature. No, but you said something about uh, the uh, the columns, the ventral column and the dorsal column being motor or sensory. I'm mixing them. So the this dorsal column are in the posterior aspect of the spinal cord, and that's all going to be sensory. This ventral yeah, area of the spinal cord will be your motor area. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, you can see here, this is kind of where they fall. So all sensory over here. So the sensory fibers always go to the dorsal side. They come into the dorsal column and then they travel up to the brain. When they get to the bottom portion of the brain stem, that medulla, that's when they decussate and cross, okay? So it will be the dorsal column until it crosses, then it changes names to the medial lemniscus. All right, and you see arm, trunk, leg, Kind of how they fall. That's how I had it outlined. All right. And so this is your ALS system. So pain and temperature, pain and temperature, pain and temperature, always go together. Keep those together in your head. They travel right here, this ALS. Now, the thing about them is they cross over immediately. Th these are the outliers. Okay. These are the ones that cross over immediately. So unless they talk about the lesion directly th at the same vertebral level or the same level, it's going to be contralateral because they cross over at that level, okay? So whereas the dorsal column or even the cortical spinal tract, it's different. They, they can travel up that, um, that uh, ipsilateral side and then at the base of the brainstem to cross over. The spinal thalamic tract or the ALS, this pain and temperature fibers, they cross over immediately. So generally anytime you're talking about a problem, it's gonna to be to the contralateral side. Okay, and you can see that here, the same level of the spinal cord, they cross over, okay? And we'll go over uh, the brown cord. If you understand that, you basically get it. Like that's the, the hemi section that we talk about. But if you can understand that, which we'll get to in a little bit, um, it'll make sense. Okay, so you can see kind of how everything runs. These are our sensory systems. Remember, that means they're going from the body to the brain one way motor systems going brain to the body right so sensory is coming in uh, these pain and temperature are coming uh, so this is left this is right so these pain and temperature fibers have crossed 
they've decussated and they're gonna travel up to the brain on the opposite side. DCML track, touch, vibration, proprioception, travel up the ipsilateral side, get to the bottom of the brainstem and then they cross, okay? Make sure you, that makes sense to you. Now, people get tripped up on this. It's basically um, just a protective mechanism, okay? Um, it basically, if you've done some of the practice questions, what you see is you get a two to three level buffer zone, okay? So if you had, let's see, C3, four, five, six, seven, and T1. Or actually there's a C8, no, we need to use C8, sorry. Um, wait, C7, no, there's seven verte vertebral, right? And then T1, my bad, sorry. There's eight vertebrae. All right, so how this works is you get a two level buffer zone, okay? So if you get an injury from C3, four, five, if you get an injury here, you get a two level buffer zone. So if they say there's an injury to C3 to T1, where, where would you feel the injury? Well, like I said, you get a two level buffer zone, okay? And that's because of Lasauer's track, okay? It's just, they let them cross over. And so that if you, it basically means if you had just a mild injury to one or two levels, the other levels can kind of compensate because they kind of talk to each other, okay? It's, it, it's protective mechanism. But when you're doing practice questions, you should be able to do it like this. If you get a two level buffer zone. So if you had an injury from C3 to T1, where would you feel it? Well, because you had that two level buffer zone, you would only feel it in C5 and C6. Am I wrong? Is there eight? Yeah, There's... there are eight. Thank you. I thought it was in there. Eh. <laughs> Sorry. Eight, yes. It, it, yeah. All right, where's the thingy? Here we go. Yes, there's eight. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Now, um, Right, so you knock out two, I'm sorry, you have a two level buffer zone, so you're only gonna feel it there. So the question is gonna say, you had an injury between C3 through C8, where are you gonna feel the sensory loss? Only at C5 and C6, why is that? Because the top two and the bottom two are protected from Lasauer's track. That's all you really need to know. If you wanna know why, it's because, it's because C7 and C8 also talk to T1 and T2, okay? So they have these extra fibers. So since they talk down here, uh, they're protected, okay? It's like a backup file, right? They sent it there, so they're protected. Same thing on the way up. But the trick simply is if you have a lesion, you just block off the first two, block off the bottom two, the lesions in the middle. I know the notes say two to three, but when I've done practice questions, I've always just blocked off the first and blocked off the bottom two. Okay, now for completeness sake, you could do it the other way too. So let's say they said you had sensory loss to C5 and C6, okay? And they say, where is, how big is the lesion? Well, since they're saying this is where you are symptomatically, you know that the lesion has to involve C3 and C4. They're buffered, but they're still technically in the lesion. And C7, and good old C8, right? Okay, so it works both ways. Let me just explain it again. If they say you had a lesion between C3 and C8, where are you gonna feel the sensory loss? C5 and C6, two levels up, two levels down buffered. If they tell you you have, they could do it the opposite way. They could say you are symptomatic, you have sensory loss at the levels of C5 and C6, what, what, what is included? Well, you have to put them in there as well, okay? I know it's a little tricky, but if you use this trick, two up, two down, you'll be fine. Y'all should have come across some practice questions like that, um, but that's just how I do it. All right. Brown Secord, I think, okay, I'm gonna use the DLA for this one to go through it. 
and then I have the other one too, the string of value. All right. Oh, okay. Now, basically, a syringo mylia is um, why it's a syrinx, right? It's a widening. It's like a, a mass or a widening in the central canal right here. Okay. So what we know uh, is that in this central canal, if it gets widened, well, what do we know crosses over? We know we're talking about it, that a, those ALS fibers cross over at the level, right? So if we had a big old syrinx here blocking or compressing those um, those fibers that are crossing, uh, we're gonna lose bilateral sensation, all right? They talk about a cape-like distribution, okay? So what actually happens is, is let's see. Um, okay, well, okay, you can kind of see it here. You see this syrinx? This is a widening, right? So it's basically compressing on these fibers that are crossing at the level. Those fibers that cross right there are your pain and temperature fibers. So what ends up happening is you could see this syrinx right here. These pain and temperature fibers, sorry. These pain and temperature fibers that cross right here are right here, right? You see the yellow, okay? So you lost at that level, you lost because of the compression, the pain and temperature. Now, technically the syrinx can expand wider and you can get problems with the other tracks, but this is the whole point. The point is that they like to use this is because you need to know that those ALS, those pain and temperature fibers cross right near that opening, that central canal, okay? So because they cross right there, um, that's why um, you get that cape-like distribution, okay? So like, um, that's why they say it's bilateral. So um, if they ever talk about cape-like distribution, um, that's what they're talking about. Does it have to be bilateral? Yes, it has to be bilateral, okay? Because you're pressing on the central canal right here. These fibers are gonna cross in the same little area. It has to be bilateral. You would expect the anterior white commissure right here. You would expect that, okay? Um, okay, so. Uh, where's the picture? Here we go. All right. So we had an injury right here. Okay. We'll make this as simple as possible. The injuries right here. Um, so what has crossed already at this injury? Well, you would expect these pain and temperature fibers from everywhere below have crossed every from below this level, these pain and temperature fibers, right? Remember I said that the pain and temperature fibers cross right away. So anytime you have an injury, it's likely that everything downstream, it has to be contralateral because these have all crossed, okay? Now, this blue is the DCML track. It doesn't cross until it gets to the base of the brain stem, right? So this hasn't crossed. So anytime you have this brown saccord syndrome, you will get uh, a lesion, um, uh, ipsilateral lesion here, right, at the level but you will also lose contralateral ALS and ipsilateral DCML, okay? Why is that? That's because the, a the ALS tract is crossed by the time it gets to this point, everything downstream of it, and the DCML tract doesn't cross until it gets to the brainstem, okay? So that's how it works, okay? And if you wanna talk about Lasauer's tract, I mean, technically you're protected two levels up and two levels down, okay? So that gets a little more complicated, but uh, in regards to this, um, you are you will have uh, Lasau. I'm sorry, pain and temperature from two levels down. Okay, right. So that's why this has this two level gap right here. That's because this is Lasau's track. You're protected here, or technically it's on this side, but yeah, this red part is protected on here. Okay, I hope that made sense. If it doesn't, I could. Let me try again. Um, is that all they had for that? Okay. Uh, well, you can see here at least, look, so with the syrinx right in the middle, when they cross over, that's why these are pain and temperature fibers. If the syrinx is there, it's blocking that, it's compressing that. So you're gonna get that cape-like cape, uh, cape -like distribution, loss of pain and temperature. Okay. Let's just, let me just do this one more time for you guys. Let's see. Okay, um, we'll go through it. At the level of the lesion, 
painted. So Brown Sequoia is a hemi section, hemi section. This whole thing got knocked out. Okay. Um, so painted temperature went across over, right, to get to this little red area. Okay. So it's knocked out. This is at the level. Okay. Now, what about below the level? Well, let me just go forward a second. You see all this red part? This is the part we're talking about here. Below the lesion, everything crosses over at the level. So by the time we get to the injury, everything prior to the leg area um, it, it has crossed over already. That's why you've lost contralateral um, pain and temperature, okay? Because everything down here has crossed already, contralateral, okay? Now, the touch vibration proprioception, it travels ipsilaterally until it gets to the base of the brain, to the brain step. So you would uh, anticipate these tracks that are communicating to the brain uh, stay ipsilateral, so the ipsilateral side is knocked out. Okay, now remember I said you're, you're protected two levels down, two levels up, two levels down. Well, in this case, those two levels down um, is why when you look at this, we're starting here, not actually in the gray area because you're protected ALS or the pain and temperature is protected two levels down, okay? Two levels below the lesion. All right, so again, injury here, you lost, you lost everything here because you knocked out that you, your, your hemisection, you, you, um, all of those got severed, all of the nerves, but the tracks below, ALS crosses, so you lose contralateral ALS, DCML hasn't crossed till it gets to the brain, so you haven't lost those yet. I'm sorry, so those haven't crossed yet, so you have ipsilateral on that side, okay? This is kind of how a lot of the questions you're going to get are going to be asked. They're going to involve this, but they're also going to talk about brain lesions as well with upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons. Because if it's, there's a problem in the brain, um, yeah, you know, you're going to have contralateral loss to the whole side of the body, you know, uh, hemiparalysis or whatnot. Okay, so you need to do practice questions with these. Um, it, it really just takes sitting down with it and trying to work through them. All right. Um, Right, now, as I mentioned earlier, both of the sensory tracks, ALS, DCMML, are three point uh, or three neuron chains. You get the lower motor neuron to you get to the level, at least with the ALS to the level, and then it crosses over, right, at the level. That second order neuron is gonna get to the thalamus. Remember, the thalamus is the relay center, okay? And it's gonna go to the primary somatosensory cortex, which is in the anterior part of the parietal lobe, right? Okay, uh, DCML has a three order track too. The, cord the motor, the cortical spinal tract does not relay in the thalamus. It's just a two, uh, two order neuron. Okay, and as I mentioned earlier, this internal capsule, those project projection fibers, those are those white, mat those white neurons that help to go from the outer aspect, that gray matter of the brain to and from the spinal column. All right. Um, and you can kind of see how it works here, right? You expect the ALS to cross at the level, right? And it does, it attaches there. That second order neuron is what decussates across, goes to the thalamus, goes to the primary somatosensory cortex. Right, um, and y'all are gonna get into this. This is very much an um, uh, MB2 problem uh, when y'all start talking about this because this is cranial nerve five. So the trigeminal nuclei, yeah, y'all will get there later. So I wouldn't stress too much about this. Wor worry about the body right now, okay? This is gonna come up uh, a lot later. And I don't know, like I mentioned earlier, these blurry things, I skipped over these. These are so aggravating, I can't look at this. So it, don't feel bad about this. Don't get bogged down with this either. If you just know, you don't need to know all these nuclei, you'll learn the cranial nerve nuclei later. Just kind of know generally where the art, art, arterial supply is. But again, y'all will get into the, to the, the strokes and stuff and vascular issues um, uh, in NB2, but just kind of know anterior spinal kind of covers the anterior aspect and, and where, where everything goes, but um, it, it'll come up a lot more later. Okay. Um, right, just definitions, prostaglandin and substance P involved with pain. Uh, when the cells lice, all the, the potassium is released and that is a signal for pain. Allodynia is where you had no noxious stimuli. Oh, wait, which one? Which? 
after injury. Oh, hyperalgesia is uh, increased pain and allodynia is pain where there was no pain before, I believe. You basically, you just have a decreased pain threshold through each. Um, I think that's how it works. Allodynia is where pain where you didn't have pain before and hyperalgesia is just increased pain. Oh, here we go. Lowering, okay, not in order, right. Okay, good. Great. Um, right, so this should make sense. That first order neuron comes in to the dorsal side, the sensory side, attaches in the gray matter here. That second order neuron passes over uh, and you know you see the where the spinal canal is, where that syringomyelia will form. But that second order neuron comes across, goes to that ALS center and travels straight up to the brain, to the thalamus. Okay. And I uh, don't get too bogged down with this. This is just like the control of pain um, with endorphins and, and stuff like that. Same thing. I wouldn't. Mm -mm. Okay. And then they go through end of pain, not quite. All right. So now. As I said, these tracks are more complicated. They're, they're myelinated, um, and, but there's still a three-point turn, right? Three-point neuron system. But that first order neuron is gonna travel, get, go through the dorsal column, go up the, go through the dorsal side, travel up the dorsal column until it gets to um, the uh, lower aspect of the medulla. Then it crosses over then it gets to the thalamus. I mean, the third order neuron brings it to the primary somatosensory cortex. So basically the only difference here is where they, you know, where they travel, where they cross over, okay? So keep that in mind when you do those uh, questions. As I said before, it is called the dorsal column until it crosses over. Then it goes from this posterior aspect of the, dorsal, of, of the spinal cord and it crosses over to this medial aspect of, of the anterior side. And at that point it's called the medial lemniscus, okay? So that's the point at which it crosses. This is the lower aspect of the brainstem, the lower medulla, okay? As I said before, don't get bogged down with this. So you can see here, comes from the body, travels ipsilaterally, gets to the lower aspect of the medulla, the caudal aspect, crosses over, goes to the thalamus, okay? And then to the brain. Um, Okay. Again, y'all are gonna get into the facial stuff a lot later. I wouldn't get bogged down with that right now. Right, again, remember I said, if you have some sort of stroke or infarction here, if you overlie the homunculus here, the face, I, know, I hope y'all know what I'm talking about, the face that they use to outline this. Um, most of the, the body will be controlled um, by blood from the MCA, but that leg in the genitals comes from the ACA and they like to test on that because most people think it's, the, a lot of people get confused with the MCA, but because this interior aspect of the brain comes from the ACA, um, that's why uh, the leg is, um, gets blood. The innervation of the leg comes from here, which is supplied by the ACA. And then it just goes through how sensitive. And again, this is why the homunculus, look, you know, the, the fingertip, you have so many uh, sensory fibers in the fingertip uh, that that's why you can get two point discrimination because they're so close together, whereas your shoulders are not very uh, sensitive. And that's just what he's trying to outline there. All right, and then we're not gonna go through the exams. Uh, Y'all could do that for your um, OSCEs and stuff. This is the homunculus, you could kind of see. Um, well, this is a, person that got injured that phantom limb stuff but um don't worry about that all right and this is very important stuff right we're getting to clinical aspects so go make sure you go through these and you can understand the different problems that form herpes unilateral one dermatome uh these um glove and stocking typically uh stuff like um, diabetes will do this right you get this peripheral neuropathy that forms Syringomyelia, look at this cape-like distribution. It has to be bilateral, pain and temperature primarily. All right, and then this hemisection, brown cord syndrome. You lose both at the level. You lose dorsal column, medial lemniscus, ipsilateral all the way down. You lose loss in pain and temperature, the ALS, contralateral two levels below because of Lasauer's tract. And then of course the transection, everything, okay? 
Uh, brainstem problem. This is a thing y'all are going to deal with later uh, next when y'all do the, the head. But this is, mm, I don't even, well, so the, the, the part that crosses over for the, for, the, for the head is not at the lower aspect of the medulla. So there is a little gap between what is ipsilateral and what's contralateral. But y'all are worried about that in MB2 when y'all do the, the, the cortical bulbar tracks. All right, and remember I mentioned the, the internal capsule, those, the, those white matter fibers that cross over. So if you get um, some sort of problem, th then the, the gray matter from the brain can't communicate to any part of the other side. So that's a, a white matter issue internal capsule, primarily the posterior limb. Um, the, the face will come from the genu or the, the middle aspect, but the posterior limb is typically what they talk about um, for the, to the body. And then of course, cerebral cortex. Remember, look at this, this is ACA, right? That's why the legs affected. It's not come, this is actually the homunculus, right? You can see it, right? But we have an injury here. So as you can see, MCA does body, arm, hand, face, tongue, right? But this ACA is gonna do this leg, foot, toes, genitals, right? And we see this injury is of their leg. So it's ACA, okay? Good. All right, motor system. Now, now we're going from the brain to the muscle, right? We've got to tell the muscle what to do. Oh, no. <laughs> See, I look at things like this and I just skip ahead. This is just too much. Um, right, now, the main one you want to worry about right now, or in general, is the cortical spinal tract. If you have a general definition for the rest of these, you should be fine. They're not going to ask you like, where the rubrospinal tract crosses and all this nonsense. The only thing they're gonna worry about with the tracks with crossing and stuff is the ALS, DCML and cortical spinal tract, okay? These other ones are just ancillary uh, extra stuff, okay? So yeah, again, now upper motor neuron lesions and lower motor neuron lesions are like completely opposite, okay? So whereas lower motor neuron lesions cause a flaccid paralysis, upper motor neuron lesions cause a spastic paralysis. So a good example is if you check, check reflexes, a lower motor neuron, you get deflex reflex response, whereas upper motor neuron, you'll get a brisk hyper reflexive response, okay? So they're quite the opposite. So when they ask you and they say the patient comes in and they have weakness and they, they're a flaccid paralysis, the first thing you should think of is a lower motor neuron problem. Whereas if you have some sort of spastic paralysis or tetany or you know, they're locked up or hyperreflexic, you're thinking of this upper motor neuron problem, okay? So make sure you can keep differentiate from those. Um, doesn't say here, but one of the things that's a little tricky is lower motor neuron lesions cause what's called fasciculations, which are like little twitches. Now, off the top of your head, you may think that's more of like a spasticity, like an upper motor neuron thing. If it's twitching, it's not. Um, that's the one thing that kind of um, is confusing. So lower motor neuron, again, it's like a flaccid paralysis, but sometimes they get these things called fasciculations or fibrillations. It's just kind of this twitching effect, okay? But make sure you, that, that, that's definitive for a lower motor neuron. All right. Um, like I said, if you just kind of have a, a, a just a general understanding for uh, generally where these other tracks go, you should be fine. Um, this is good to know in case they point out on the uh, just give you like an A B C D in the different areas of the the gray matter. Just kind of like uh, remember these little pictures where the flexors and extensors go. I think that's low yield, but I'm, we might have had a question uh, surprising me on that. All right. Okay, clinical stuff. Right. So here we go. Upper motor neurons, hyperreflex or hypertonia, extensor plantar response, clonus. That means if you tap the tap the um, if you hit the reflex arc, right, it'll keep popping like that. Right. Uh, spastic paralysis. Now, everything's opposite for lower motor neuron. Flaccid paralysis. Um, um, hypo reflection, hypotonia. But like I said, keep these two in mind. These, this is this little shaking effect, but that's classified as a lower motor neuron lesion. All right, ALS is a uh, degeneration of motor neurons. It's only motor, it's not sensory. So it's all, it's all the motor neurons. 
um, but just keep in mind, it's completely motor. Uh, you get this um, in this area here, um, right? So all of these motor neurons are affected and over time you end up getting respiratory paralysis and whatnot. So just keep in mind that is always a uh, motor neuron, but it's, it, it can be upper or, mode, or, or lower motor neurons, but it's only motor. All right. Now, as I said, you, you didn't really need to know where all the nuclei were, but it's good to know like some sort of infarct of the anterior spinal artery. You could see what that encompasses because that's gonna give blood supply to the anterior aspect of the brainstem. I'm sorry, of the spinal cord, okay? So you can see that here, that's gonna affect your ALS tracts here and the anterior horn. So you'll probably get a lot of motor problems, which would be expected, okay? And you can see that here. All right. And because, um, because those, uh, those tracks form here, remember that this could be a problem that could end up being upper or mo lower motor neuron problem, depending on the level that you're at, right? So if, you, if you're affecting the tracks, it'll be lower, it'll be upper motor neuron. Whereas if you're uh, affecting where the neuron comes in, um, you could be at the lower motor neuron. So it completely depends um, on the level that you're at. Central cord, so this is very similar to the syringomyelia. Um, you can see where they cross there, right. Okay, so again, I know it gets confusing and it's daunting and it's a lot of material, but by all means, focus on the clinical aspects. All right, now, as I said, lower motor neuron, it's a two motor, it's a two neuron system, it doesn't, um, it doesn't uh, go through the, uh, the thalamus, it's just a two motor neuron system. So it comes through, it crosses at the lower aspect of the medulla, and after it crosses, it goes up contralaterally to the motor cortex of the brain. Okay, and there's your homunculus, we kind of talked about that. Um, not terribly important that you know this, I guess knowing that the pyramidal cells in layer five are the most important. Um, center. Right. Remember, internal capsule is white matter. It's a root. It is um, those projection fibers that tra travel through. Okay. And again, posterior capsule is where all of these cortical spinal tract fibers will go. Cortical ball bar, as I mentioned, come through the middle aspect or the knee or the bend point here. We don't really talk about the anterior one too much. All right. And you can see lower aspect of the brainstem, that's where they cross, right around the same level as the DCML tracks. Okay, um, so yeah, it's good to know this and to know this, um, you get spinal shock. Uh, what ends up happening is you'll, and they'll, you, they'll be able to see this in how it's outlined in the stem of the question. They'll tell you it's a lower motor neuron problem and then at about the four week mark, it switches to an upper motor neuron problem. You don't need to understand the pathology of why, it's just how the spine is shocked like that, like severed. So um, eventually, uh, initially you get lower motor neurons, it takes about a month, and then it develops into upper motor neuron problems. So if you see that shift, I can't off the top of my head think of another disease that has that shift from one to the other, but um, keep, so keep that in mind. Right, okay, um, we talked about this. Yeah, okay, but it's good to know, right? You would expect mo lower motor neuron, they, it hasn't crossed, right? When, at, at the point where it connects to the second order neuron, that second, oh, that second mo motor neuron is the upper motor neuron and it is the one that crosses. So anytime you get lower motor neuron symptoms, you have to still be ipsilateral, okay? And the contrast is true as well, if you get, Upper motor neuron problems, you're on the comp, you're, um, hold on time out. No, that's not necessarily, tr necessarily true for upper motor neuron because it crosses at the top. Let me say that again, just in regard to lower motor neurons, since the lower motor neuron stays ipsilateral, the upper motor neuron is the one that decussates across, okay? So the, if it's a lower motor neuron problem, it has to be ipsilateral. So anytime you see these symptoms, this flaccid paralysis, it's lower motor neuron. And then we talked about Brown's cord syndrome, right? But it, it holds true for this as well. This is very similar to the DCML track, okay? 
again, the, the tract is going down to the motor part, but if you get a hemisection, uh, you're gonna affect those, um, those fibers there, right? So the contralateral brain will affect, or will be in control um, uh, of those fibers. So anything distal to it will be affected, okay? Right, but the, the contralateral side will not be affected. So this is the same side of the injury. So the side of the injury is gonna be what works. These contralateral side is where you're gonna see, um, um, excuse me, the, uh, right, so, well, okay, so sorry. It depends where the lesion is, right? So we're saying this is below where it decussates. So anything contralateral to it uh, will be fine because it's gonna decussate at the, the lower aspect of the brain stem, okay? So you're good to go, but anything like this picture, anything on this side hasn't crossed yet. So it's below the, the brain stem. Unfortunately, you, you really just have to do questions with this. Um, it's one of those things. All right, so quadra versus paraplegia. Um, and you can see if you had a full section, right? That would be not good depending on if it's above the levels of the arms or not, whether it be quadra or, or paraplegia. Okay. All right, and then quickly, um, yeah, just um, these right here are what you want to know. The 1A fibers, these are just reflexive. It doesn't, it doesn't have to go up to the brain. This is just a reflex arc that happens. So the 1A fiber is actually on the muscle spindle and they have the alpha, I'm sorry, they have the gamma response. So this is going to give a positive impulse to the reflex. It's going to cause um, tightening of the muscle. So if you hit your patellar, uh, your patellar tendon, this muscle spindle, the 1A fiber and the gamma fibers, or sorry, the 1A neuron and the gamma fibers are going to activate and cause contraction of your quadricep to make your leg go up. Whereas the 1B fibers and these alpha fibers are inhibitory. So what they do is they cause relaxation of your hamstrings. Okay. Um, and they'll also be in effect when it comes to if you overexert your muscles, sort of like you're bench pressing or whatnot, and if it's, if it's too strong, these, these muscle fibers, these inhibitory fibers will, will, will break down prior to you injuring yourself, ideally, okay? So the main thing to remember is 1A and gamma are a positive arc, whereas the 1B and the alpha fibers are a negative response to it, okay? And you can read through this. Um, this is, yeah, I put a star on this slide. So just knowing the difference here, um, you should be good. Um, right, talked about this. That's what you would expect. Would it be ipsilateral? Yes, of course. Lower motor neurons haven't crossed yet. What is this? Mm, looks like a pinched nerve over here coming out. So you probably have a lower motor neuron problem, some sort of, um, paralysis or whatever, a pinched nerve on one side. So maybe pain going down one side, it looks like. Uh, I wouldn't worry about this. I don't think that was tested. He, I think, never mind. All right. Okay, uh, okay, I'm gonna do this. Lindsay's gonna touch on this too when she goes through the eye stuff, but I'll, I'll touch on it quickly. Um, I just wanted to point out a few things before. I'm, I do apologize and something come up, I, I have to run, but um, so remember anything from the retina when it gets to the eye is the opposite side. So whatever is in the top left of your visual field will come to the bottom right of the retina, okay? From the retina from there is where you wanna go. So the way I do that when I do these is, um, I think he actually had, Okay, um, yeah, so we can use this one. Um, so go from the eye directly to the retina. So if you have a problem in the upper outer aspect of the eye, it's gonna go to the lower inner aspect of the retina. And then you know the inner part is going to cross over, right? It's gonna to go to the other, upper, other side. Now, it, because if it's in the lower aspect, it's gonna go on the lower aspect of this turn. And um, uh, uh, so the parietal radiation, I'm sorry, the temporal radiation. The parietal radiation is up top and the temporal radiation is on the bottom. So if you have a crossover here, the lower aspect of the retina is gonna to go to the lower aspect, which is the temporal radiation, okay? Which means you're gonna get a loss here. 
Um, so I think, I think y'all do this a couple of times. Like y'all may have just, how many more days of lecture do y'all have? Y'all might end up doing this in NB2. Do y'all have how many more? Test this Friday. Two. You have two, two days. Day. Are y'all doing more visual stuff? We're in the ear. Oh goodness, okay. Well, the thing, I'm surprised y'all are even touching on this at all because this is this has a lot to do with cranial nerve two and vision and stuff. So I think they're just, I, I don't want y'all to get too bogged down on this because they're just introducing you to this. Um, for example, like y'all go through these different radiations and stuff and all of the injuries, but y'all are barely touching on this in, in this in this lecture. So um, I think just knowing the basics and like where the things cross over, um, you should be fine. But just remember that, uh, how it correlates um, from the from the eye is opposite the retina, and then you just track it across. The inner portions cross over, and the outer portions stay the same. And depending on if you're upper or lower, determines whether you go on parietal or temporal aspects. Okay, um, but for some reason, I remember covering this in a lot more detail than just this one lecture. So um, I, I'm assuming they're just touching on it uh, right now. But Lindsay's going to go through this again with you guys, um, uh, she's gonna cover the week three stuff. Like I said, I'm gonna have to run. Um, I do apologize. We, we, I mean, if, I, if I'd have known, I didn't realize we had tomorrow off. If, if I'd have known that, we would have just done this tomorrow and we'd have had more time, but it's my bad on that. Um, anyway, we'll take a five minute break and then Lindsay's gonna go ahead and take over. I'll do my best to get this up tonight. If I can't, um, I'll get it up tomorrow. As always, message us if y'all have any issues. Okay, Lindsay, all yours. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to take a few minute break. So I'm going to the bathroom, get coffee. I'm binging coffee. So we'll come back in a few. Okay, for those of you that are coming back in, we'll start in a moment. Um, I will not have the chat open during this so that I can focus on the slides. And I do not have anyone else with me right now. So um, nobody is monitoring the chat, which means if you um, have a question, you need to stop me, please just unmute yourself and say, hey, Lindsay, I have a question, something like that. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started again, just running through these. I'm going to point out some high yield stuff that I think you guys need to focus on in the, um, in the next week. And then some complicated topics that I know I had some trouble with, um, just forewarning the visuals and ear stuff, or the visual stuff particularly, is a little complicated and I learned it for the exam, but it's still kind of iffy for me, so we're going to work through it together. Okay. So diseases of the NMJ and motor unit. Um, whenever you see something diseases, um, you might do this already, but just break it down, chunk it by the disease, and then you know understand the clinical presentation versus what they might test you on. Um, that's how I approach anything pathology related. You need to know the clinical presentation and that's really gonna clue you in on what you need to know. Um, so the motor, unit, you have the alpha motor neuron plus um, all of the fibers that it innervates. And that's just a definition, quite honestly. And then this is just a breakdown. This is your intro. So you have the neurogenic and you have the myogenic. Um, again, that's really just a definition intro to, hey, this is kind of what you're going to be seeing um, for the rest of the lecture. Um, so again, this is along the same lines. It's giving you the parts of the axon and then um, different diseases, diseases associated with different areas. Um, so lesions of the nerves of soma or the axon, so the cell body or the axon, so it's all inclusive. You have Lou Gehrig's, um, if it's the soma, Lou Gehrig's poliomyelitis, different etiologies, manifestations. This wasn't too, too high yield. Um, poliomyelitis, this, just understand um, the definition, essentially. I don't think this was too high yield on our exam. Um, 
But a big thing here is the paralysis of the diaphragm. Um, you know, you saw, I think everyone's seen pictures of the iron lung. That is because you can't breathe because if you um, paralyze the diaphragm, there is no uh, motion of the lung. Okay. The big thing here, this, this is something that they like to focus on. Um, I just put my whiteboarding, a link to my whiteboarding album in my, um, in my group dog mom. If you want to peruse that, you honestly don't have to, but I get a lot of people asking for my whiteboarding because I organize all these lectures, how it makes sense to me. Um, but this is one of those things that I um, spent a lot of time mapping out, drawing, because I like drawing out a certain section and then putting the diseases where it goes because I'm a very visual person and I like to, um, and then it just makes sense to me. So um, you've already had a DLA or a lecture over this. I don't remember, but it's in my one of my whiteboarding images where I break it all down. But these are really just definitions. So you need to know the um, what goes on with it. So alpha latrotoxin, it's release of acetylcholine versus beta bungrotoxin. Um, you have acetylcholine depletion, which is preceded by an excessive um, release. So acting on protein, yeah, in, involved in the excess cytosis. So you have the release and then it's depleted. Um, botulinum, acetylcholine uh, release, curare, um, blocks the receptors. If anyone ever watched the show, um, The Era, they talk about that a lot. Um, Lambert Eaton, we already went over this, so I'm not going to hit it again. This is a pretty high yield one, high yield in that they will probably ask it like maybe one or two questions, but just start this and know that they will probably test you on it. Yeah. Oh, the, um, this might be a thing. Mini EPP is unchanged. Should he go over the EPPs with you guys? This stuff? I don't remember. I wasn't listening to it. Everything. Did he go over this? He should have. But if he didn't, we can go over it. Opening up the chat a little bit. Okay. But okay, so this is saying that oh, the difference between waxing and waiting. This can be one of those buzzwords in a question stem that kind of tells you what you should be focusing in on. So this one is waxing. So the more um, stimulation it gets, the higher the, um, no, normal. This is stimulation. Yeah, it just um, gets stronger over time. Yeah, they focus a lot on that, but I, I don't feel like it was that high yield. Um, congenital myasthenias. Know this definition, know what it is, the clinical presentation, be able to just identify it essentially. Um, so presenting young is the biggest thing. Um, I really don't remember this being a big thing, but uh, know it. So a deficiency of acetylcholinesterase would essentially, that means you don't have the metabolism of the acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. So it's, it's there to continually bind to the receptors. And so you get that depolarization of the postsynaptic um, neuron. And then just myasthenia gravis as a, so anti, antibodies to the receptors. Oh, I remember spending so much time understanding this. I posted this in the chat, my link to my condensed NB1 diseases. I spent a really long time on that because um, it popcorns around, like it'll talk about the diseases in five different places, but in each of those places, it doesn't tell you the entire story. So I condensed it down. I spent a really long time going over this to understand the idea of this. Um, take a look at that um, if you want the condensed version of that, because I spent a really long time, especially on this. I remember going through this, whiteboarding this out, trying to understand it, and then condensing it down to like a, a sentence, because this is a lot of information. 
but essentially um, you have a lot um, a decreased density of the acetylcholine receptors at the end plate. And so if you don't have that many receptors, you're not going to have as much transmission. And then this is more of waning right here. So um, if you, the more you use something, the better or, or the worse it gets. And so you tire quickly, the muscle tires quickly. That's what this is. So rapid loss of strength, that's exactly what waning means. So the waxing would be the more you use it, the more strength you get, then this is just the waning. So you get a loss of strength um, the more you use something. So uh, the difference between waxing and waning in the uh, differential is gonna be big here. Okay, so myopathies, um, again, I don't remember this being a huge thing, but okay, so this would be the big thing you're gonna see in the clinical presentations in the vignette. You're gonna see a delayed relaxation um, after any sort of movement. So the mutation. Muscular dystrophy, you guys went over this a lot in FTM. So uh, it's the biggest thing is the dystrophin protein. So, and then X-linked receptive, those two things I always associate with muscular dystrophy. So can you identify it? So this is the patient that it has a hard time, you know, standing from a sitting position. Um, and they'll probably ask you something about um, the dystroph dystrophin protein, honestly. Yeah, have a hard time um, getting up. So they have this very characteristic way of standing up and then um, difficulty in the toe walking. And then again, um, Brady talked about this. We're not gonna hit it hard right now, but the difference between upper motor, upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron diseases or symptoms um, they will ask, they'll say which of the following, they'll, they'll give you a clinical presentation, they'll talk about a lesion somewhere, they won't tell you upper versus lower, and they'll ask which of the following is going to be a characteristic sign seen. And so you have to know, okay, is this upper, is this lower? The, um, a big one that they look at focus on is if you damage like the anterior horn cell or something like that. That's lower motor neuron, because then you're getting into the peripheral nervous system, because the... Um, uh, when you, because those are the cell bodies of the peripheral nervous system. So even though it's inside of the spinal cord, even though you're still in that system, it's the cell body that goes to the peripheral nervous system. So it is a lower motor neuron. I remember hitting that hard and that's something that um, people always have questions about because it is still in the spinal cord, but it's technically a lower motor neuron because it's in the peripheral nervous system. So the alpha motor neuron in the, um, and the spinal cord is part of the um, peripheral nervous system. So just understand that. But again, lower motor neuron, no, lower <laughs> motor neuron systems are going to be more of weakness versus upper, which is um, more um, like a spastic kind of thing. So PNS disorders, um, again, uh, positive versus negative manifestations. So excess or loss of something. Um, so positive fasciculations, paresthesias. Uh, this is essentially an addition of something, um, whereas a negative symptom is a loss of something. So a paralysis is a loss of movement. Paresis is a loss of movement. Areflexia, a loss of. Anhydrosis, loss of. So um, that's how you can think of positive versus negative symptoms. I don't remember that being huge. That either. Okay, to carpal tunnel syndrome, I do remember this being tested. Um, maybe one question, two questions. But go through this lecture. Um, simply just make a list of all of them. Again, this is in my NB1 diseases document that I posted for you guys um, going through the presentation for this. But it, so median nerve compression at the wrist is 
was hit very, very, very hard in MSK, it comes back. But that's the biggest thing about carpal tunnel syndrome. Crash injury, um, nine times out of 10, it's gonna be, uh, this is an acute traumatic compression. So you can get, so within a crush injury, you can get a um, transaction. I'm trying to pick out the biggest high yield things for you guys right now. Oh, I remember spending a lot of time on this too. And I don't remember it being a huge thing on the exam. Guillain Barre, um, Brady went over it too. So this is just another place where they stick that in there for you guys. Hansen disease, leprosy. So it's a skin and it, um, an infection that affects the skin and the PNS. Diabetes, this is a classic presentation. It's the distal extremities, essentially. Okay, basal ganglia. I'm gonna go away from this for a sec. Um, I personally did not like the pictures uh, that they gave. And so we're gonna go over it together because I mapped it out for you guys. And I'm gonna check the chat real quick to make sure. Okay, so basal ganglia. You have the, I'm gonna change the color of my pan. You have the cortex up here, Ooh. cortex up here. And then this is the whole basal ganglia structure, essentially. So you have the thalamus right here. You have the subthalamic nu um, yeah, subthalamic nucleus. Um, oh my God, I'm forgetting all of my things. What's under the subthalamic nucleus, guys? I'm not looking at the chat. Jesus. It's losing, it's, it's going out of my brain. Is it substantia nigra? Yes, thank you. Oh my God. Substantia nigra, thank you. And then the globus pallidus, internal, external, and then striatum. So I, this confused me a lot. It did. I, it took me a really long time to understand this. If you subscribe to Osmosis, Osmosis has a great video that goes over this. Um, and their high yield notes, that's what I looked at because I did not, I personally did not like the pictures and the SGU lecture. So we're going to break it down. So the big things you need to understand to understand the basal ganglia pathway. First of all, the thalamus and the cephalamic nucleus, these are both constitution, constitutively active. And they they both are um, the glutaminergic um, pathway, so they're excitatory. So both of these are constitutionally act, constitutively active, and they both secrete glutamate, which is excitatory. Now, what does the thalamus does? Why do we even care about the basal ganglia? What is this whole thing? Well. We are executing a smooth movement because the sen the signals you're getting from the cortex, the very it's like a rough draft. It's just it's like a word vomit kind of thing. It's the first thing you think of when you are trying to create something. It's very rough. It's it's not fine tuned. What the basal ganglia does is fine tune it. So that's why we need it here. So um, that is its primary job. So the first thing you need to know is that both the thalamus and um, the uh, Subthalamic, uh, yeah, subthalamic nucleus are constitutively active and that they are glute, um, glutaminergic, so they're excitatory. So know that. Now, everything else is going to be GABAergic, so inhibitory. So if we're just talking about kind of a normal um, thing, 
you have, so the subthalamic nucleus is going to talk to the globus pallidus internus. So remember the subthalamic nucleus, this is excitatory. So this is going to stimulate whatever the GPI does. So GPI, that's its own thing, but subthalamic nucleus, since it's excitatory, is going to excite whatever the GPI does. Well, the GPI is inhibitory. So it's going to tell the GPI to do what it does, inhibit. And what does it inhibit? It inhibits the thalamus. So that's kind of what it does there. And because it's going, remember, this is constitutionally active, constitutively active, thalamus is constitutively active. So the GPI, is, when it's activated, is going to send the GABA, um, GABA to inhibit it. So that's kind of the basis right there for now. Now you have kind of two, oh no, you have two pathways. You have direct and indirect that kind of um, control the different movements um, or control the thalamus essentially. So direct. You have a signal from the cortex that goes to the striatum. Now this, it, now this is going to activate whatever the striatum's job is. Well, the striatum's job happens to be GABAergic. So it's, going, so it's going to send out an inhibitory signal. It sends its signal to the GPI. Now remember the subthalamic nucleus is already constitutional, constitutively active, which is activating this right here. It's saying, go, 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 go. But the striatum is now saying, no, 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 no. So you're actually turning off this inhibition because the GPI is GABAergic, it's inhibiting. So, so it's essentially telling the thalamus to chill out. Hey, I know, I know you wanna do your thing. I know you wanna stay on, stop just chill. However, when you go to the direct pathway, signal to the striatum, it's going to um, activate whatever the striatum's job is. Well, it, the striatum's job happens to be to turn something off. What is it turning off? It's turning off the GPI, which is essentially inhibitory. So if you stop this inhibitory signal to the thalamus, you're turning off inhibition. So that's what this is doing. You're turning off the inhibition. This is my um, abbreviation for inhibition. That's what the direct pathway is doing. You're turning off inhibition. Now, I'm gonna take this away. Now we're talking about the indirect pathway. The indirect pathway, still cortex to striatum right here, but the striatum is then going to go to the globus pallidus externum which is going to go to the subthalamic nucleus right here. So you're activating the striatum to tell him to do his job. His job is to inhibit whatever he talks to. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the globus pallidus externus. Externum, external, external globe. Uh, well, you guys know what I'm talking about. So essentially, oh, no. So essentially you're, um, you're turning off this right here. So you're, inhi you're inhibiting this. So the end result, yeah, you're inhibiting the, yeah, I have it over here, sorry. So the end result, yeah, it goes palace externus, then you go to the um, subthalamic nucleus, which of course, it's little thing, does that. So it's kind of indirectly coming in here. What this does it is kind of turning on inhibition. So indirect, you're turning on the inhibition. So if we go over here, I took this from osmosis from their high yield notes because I love them. So it's so because uh, I think this picture um, is very simple. It's condensed. I like it. Um, so you are freeing the excitatory signals. This, oh my God, I can't form sentences. Thalamus is free to send excitatory signals to the motor cortex. So you're turning off the inhibition versus indirect, which is preventing um, it from sending excitatory signals. So you're turning on the inhibition. That's the big thing here. So now that we've um, 
gone through that, I'm going to go through the lecture. So important terms, um, hyper and hypokinesia, hopefully we know those, disinhibition, so loss of inhibition, you're turning off the inhibition. Um, so I'm not going to go through this because I just kind of went through it right there. So you have direct and indirect pathway. And the fine tuning of the movements that are coming from the cortex, remember I said the cortex is a very rough draft of whatever movement you're going to. The indirect and direct pathways is fine tuning that. So it's a balance between those two that are going to fine tune whatever movement um, is coming out. So it's very, very, very important. Okay. Dopamine is really big when you start getting into the pathology. So um, there are two receptors, the DR1, DR2. So know the difference between the two. So you have excitation versus the direct pathway, and it's going to inhibit versus the indirect pathway. This is basically, this is essentially, it's still dopamine, but it depends on the receptor that it is binding to. So if it binds to this receptor, it's gonna do this, it binds to this receptor, it has a different pathway. Um, so understand that, and this is what I was talking about, the balance between indirect and direct pathways. Why do we care? Well, Parkinson's disease. So this is a diff, an, a insufficient release of dopamine. So remember, dopamine is kind of talking to both indirect and direct pathways. And so if you don't have good release, you're not um, getting that communication. So reducing activity of the direct, remember this causes excitation, this turns off inhibition and increasing activity of the indirect pathway, which turns um, on inhibition. So it'll do different things. So dagger striatal highlight that. Um, this is important in Parkinson's disease, knowing that it is a nigro striatal dopaminergic um, insufficiency. So you're getting hypokinesis right here. So decrease inhibition of GPI. Okay, went over that. I also spent a lot of time on this slide, but I wish I hadn't. I don't think there's a huge thing here. Yeah, so know the symptoms. So if they describe a patient to you, be able to understand what they're talking about. So the big, 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 big thing is resting tremor versus an intention tremor. That's different. An intention tremor is when you have a tremor when you tremor when you start an action, and that's going to be more Huntington's. Um, so you need to know this clinical picture right here. This is very high yield. Um, they will use terms directly from this, and not all of them are listed over here on the left. Look at the picture. Look at the picture, go around, um, write down or make note of those clinical features because they will use those clinical features. And if you know them, then you, you um, know they're talking about Parkinson's. Again, already talked about this, so I'm not going to go into it further. This is the best, um, this is the biggest form of management right now, L-dopa and carbidopa. It has a name. If you put um, the combination has a name, I forget what it is. But the biggest thing you need to know right now is what carbidopa does to allow L-dopa to work. Um, so surgical ablation, ablation and deep brain stimulation, DBS is also something that they can use. Um, we'll talk about this in term four. Um, this is um, surgical ablation. So know the two that you would ablate. So subthalamus or the globus pallidus internal. Huntington's disease, so degeneration of GABA that project to the GPE. So autosomal dominant, they love um, talking about the inheritance pattern here, so make sure you understand that. They love to ask about sydenham disease. 
So this is, I believe that's um, the unilateral presentation of Korea, Korea, however you say that. No, that's how many bullets. Yeah, no hemibolismus, and then no the synonym. I remember a couple questions on that. Okay, I scrolled through this on purpose because when we were going through this lecture, this is a cellar, cerebellar lesion lecture, cerebellar lecture, because at the very end of this, after he went, after the professor went through all of this stuff, he's like, this is where I'm taking your test questions. So I'm going to start here because this is the, this is the meat of the lecture as it was told to us. Um, so this is really about knowing the presentations and being able to associate it with areas of lesion in the cerebellum. So you're talking about the anterior lobe is you're talking about posture and movement of, of limbs. So you're going to have an ipsilateral ataxia, gait ataxia. This is a big one, um, malnutrition. Um, so often accompanying chronic alcoholism, alcoholism very classically affects the cerebellum. And so you have this almost characteristic gait, this characteristic behavior of somebody who has chronic alcoholism affecting the cerebellum. Um, so that's why malnutrition is put in here. But yes, um, please know both terms, anterior lobe and then spinocerebellum. Um, if you have physio, the images and physio are fantastic at conceptualizing the anatomy of the cerebellum. So I would highly recommend you go and look at that if you subscribe to that. Um, and then posterior lobe, um, so cerebro, cerebro cell, cerebellum. So you still have ataxia, decomposition of movement, dysarthria, this big disener, um, dysenergies, <laughs> intention tremor, hypotonia, and then flocculonodular. So this is equilibrium related. So nystagmus, tilted head, um, head nodding, truncal ataxia versus the gait ataxia. And then, you know, specific um, pathologies here. Um, so if you have a, a cerebellar tumor, um, I kind of remember this image, but so we're talking about nystagmus, truncal ataxia, broad based stands, hypotonia. So this is actually um, affecting multiple areas. This is actually everything because nystagmus is more of the flocculonodular, truncal is um, um, flocculonodular, not, mm, I can't say that. Uh, but um, it can encompass a lot. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he's like cerebellar too. It's just everything. Hey, Lindsay. Hey, Kish. What's up? I just wanted to check in on you guys, make sure you guys are thriving in NB1. Um, feel free to shoot me any messages. I'll be here. Um, make Thanks, sure man. you guys cover all the stuff that Brady and Lindsay have told you guys already. And I'm pretty sure they're killing it. Make sure you guys learn your PICA and ICA. We got like- Oh my God, yes. On these. Yes. No, um, these. I was just about to say something about that. Especially the cranial nerve components, um, you'd need to know just generally, okay, for those don't, like what I said, like four above, four, um, four at, and four below, pretty sure Brady told you guys that as well, high, high yield, like they will love to test you guys on that. Thanks, Kesh. Got you guys. Um, they love alcohol, accelerator, degeneration. I touched on that a second ago. It's the thiamine, the B1 deficiency. I don't remember this being a thing, but of course, look over it. Okay. Next one. Orbits and the eye. 
Um, the, some of this anatomy and the histology, yes, the histology for the ear and the eye are high yield. Um, it's not difficult. They're not gonna trick you with it, but you have to know it because if you don't, you just don't. Um, I don't have my notes in front of me because I didn't bring them to the island, but this was a thing. Um, Dr. Haig, does, does Haig still go, is the one that goes over this? Yes. Okay. So he probably did for you what he did for us. He spends a few minutes on the slide defining each of these, know them. Each of these were very high yield. So the description of all of them, um, I don't remember if all of these he puts in the subsequent lecture, but definitely know them because I'm pretty sure we had a question on each one of these. Um, so this is just the orientation of the orbit and all of the bones. Um, you need to need to need to know which um, fissure different structures are coming out of. It's very high yield. So superior orbital fissure, three, four, um, uh, first branch of trigeminal, six, superior ophthalmic vein, like all of this is very high yield. So put a star in the slide. You have to know it. It's more rote memorization than anything on this particular slide. Again, I just want to go through the really big high yield things. Kish, do you remember the development of the eye? Oh, this is the big thing here. So the keyhole um, people, this um, is incomplete closure of the retinal fissure. Um, so highlight this, star this. This is the big thing on here. This is what is going to tell you what it is um, as in all embryo stuff. Um, We'll go over this probably more in the histology of the eye. So I'm not going to hit huge right here. Um, yeah, retina stuff is more high yield in um, a different lecture. So we'll talk about it at that point. Yeah, this is all high yield in another lecture. So I'm going to talk about it. Um, with respect to that. Um, so cataracts, know the presentation, know the definition. That's the biggest thing. Um, you do need to spend some time with the anatomy of the eye. It's not too complicated, but you'll get a handful of questions and it, that is more, defin more definition related. I hate to say definition, but um, you got to know it. You have to know what it is. You have to know the associations with so the relationships between all of the structures. So I actually, if you look at my whiteboarding, you'll actually see that I drew this on my whiteboard very intricately to make sure that I knew what it was. I mean, you don't have to be that extra, but um, just make sure you spend some time knowing the relationships between in the um, structures and what all of the structures are. Um, this is extremely important right here. So sensory in, um, innervation, if you have a difference between different parts, um, it will probably be tested. So upper lid, you have um, trigeminal one, a lower lid, trigeminal two. Um, yeah, bulwark conjunctive lines of the sclera, trigeminal one. Um, this is okay. So the Chalazian, the meibomian gland, this is a big thing. So this is what you need to associate this with. So the Chalazian is the, um, meibomian gland. And there's another one that they touched on. So you need to know both of those, the difference between those. Um, this is touched on later. So I won't necessarily go into it now because this is really just the introduction, but um, you need to know this, this innervation, and you probably have looked at this a hundred times, we'll go over it, but this little thing, SO4, LR6, um, 3, this is um, very important. So, um, you know, which goes with which. Lindsay, can I jump in real quick? Yeah, go for it. Um, so this is, a, this is a really important question, and a lot of you guys messaged me on it. Um, regarding your eye questions, such as those for the eye tracks and details, 
I'm going to agree with Brady and Lindsay that it's very much so heavily tested when you guys are in um, NB2, but they do like certain key clinical examples, such as what you've seen from time and time again with bitemporal hemianopsia. Like, just take those words and break it apart, and you can basically un get an understanding as which visual fields are affected. Right. You can associate that with like a pituitary adenoma. Like you can really compound on this information. So don't spend an um, egregious amount of time learning the entire um, innervation of the eye, tracks, and all of those things because their questions tend to be very clinical in nature with these. Okay. So that's just a little FYI for those who messaged me on it. Um, regarding the eye details, they really like eye histo. And I'm pretty sure Lindsay's going to cover that with you guys as well. Um, make sure you guys learn the eye histo in terms of levels, right? Like that's what they really like. We got like a handful of questions on like, you know, where your rods and cones are versus like, um, where the light sensitive component is. So focusing on those details based off, I'm telling you based off of what we had in our term. So just an FYI, putting that little preface there. Yeah. Okay. So the action of the muscles. I'm not going to lie to you. I spent so much time <laughs> on this and I confuse myself every time. Kish, did you, do you have a really good way of explaining it? Because I feel like if I try to explain it, I'm going to talk myself in circles. Yeah. The, overall, um, we learned this just so that we can assess each muscle and the cranial nerves associated with them. Um, obviously the motion of the actual muscles is what is being talked about here. When you guys do the um, H test, that is going to be um, more so aligned with the fact that um, you're isolating different muscle groups as well as cranial nerves. And you're taking it from there and in order to assess them and see if like any sort of like, is there an oculomotor palsy or is there a trochlear um, defect? Like has a, has a muscle been impinged as compared to a cranial nerve? So make sure you guys learn it that way instead of like how Brady and Lindsay, as well as how I learned it, where we just like literally whiteboarded this thing like so many times until we kind of made some kind of sense of it. Keep it clinical, keep it relevant in terms of muscle movement is what is being shown here. The H test is a little different, okay? Um, I'll link you guys out to an AMBOSS um, kind of video slash article that does a really good job of just showing you the clinical tidbits because I felt like the lectures here were just, it was too overblown. That's why I took so long mapping this out. Well, Kesh, you and I whiteboard. We know Brady did not whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, thanks. Because I had somebody asking me if there was a really good um, article or video or something to learn the eye movements, and I didn't have one because I literally I just sat here drawing it out over and over and over again. So this is saying when you test this muscle, this is what you ask the patient to do. Now the high yield stuff. If you look at the Gray's questions. The questions they're going to ask on the exam are very represented, representative um, in those grays questions. So especially these. So for example, they love the they love the one where you have the diplopia um, when you're walking down the stairs. So what the patient is doing, you know, you're looking down. So what's wrong? They love that question. So who does anyone know the answer to that question? The patient's walking down the stairs and that's where their deficit is. Is it cranial nerve four? What, what's the muscle? I'm, yeah. Superior rectus? Yeah. And then of course, you know, the um, nerve that's associated with that, but they love that one. But it, it, with respect to what they're gonna ask, for us personally, you know, they can always change it up and what they like to focus on, but it was the grace questions were very representative of how they like to ask particularly the, um, these kinds of questions. You didn't get grace questions to practice with. The ones that are assigned to you. Because the ones that they assign are the ones uh, are the topics that they are going to focus on for you guys, especially since you know you have three exams in 
and B. And so they're going to focus on different things each time. Um, the arteries, I don't remember this being a big thing. They never really, um, yeah. Oh, the, for infection, this is huge, 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 huge. They love talking about this roots of infection. Um, yeah, so put a star on this one, or we'll put an cavernous sinus. Um, exit inferior. So they're, they're going to say that the person has an infection in a particular area and they're going to ask you which of the following veins would have um, facilitated or, you know, what was a possible route for infection. So know this, it'll get, um, get you a couple questions on the exam. So um, inferior can drain from the pterygoid plexus. So if you're in the pterygoid region, inferior ophthalmic vein, um, super circular and super orbital. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about this in a bit because there's a blue. Oh, here it is. Um, I spent a lot of time on this. There was one question on this. They love focusing on nasociliary for some reason. They love, love, love the nasociliary one. I even kind of remember them being so specific as, um, which one under nasociliary, but I would look at this blue slide. Um, of course, that you have this um, visual right here, but the information that I was able to use for the exam to get the question was on this blue slide. Um, I do not remember what the question was, but I do remember laughing at myself. It's like, oh, I spent so much time on that slide, um, but put a star on this one, spend a few minutes on it, you'll get a question. Again, big, all of all roots provide a possible route of entry um, from the face and scalp to the deep intracranial structures. So emissary veins, the deep veins communicating with these. I wanna talk about the, oh. Mm. I don't know if we want to talk about this right now. Okay, histology of the eye. Fortunately, um, I remember these being pretty first and second order. So we're gonna go over what you need to understand. So the three layers is more conceptual, but you do need to understand it because they will talk about the different layers. Um, when, with respect to the layers, it might get a little like second, third order kind of thing. So yes, you do need to just understand the different layers. Again, I drew it out very painstakingly because I wanted to make sure I got it, but the layers are important here. Um, so on this slide, okay, it's just your intro. You need to know this slide inside and out. You need to understand what you're looking at here. So, um, you know, we're saying that uh, anterior versus the posterior layers of the eye here. So cornea, which is gonna be your anterior surface. Um, just understand that function and location. Okay, what was the big thing here? I'm trying to point that out for you guys. Um, this was a big thing. The keratin sulfate, I believe, uniform fibro. Yeah, strength and it's a barrier to infection. That's a really big one. Um, this was big right here. The corneal endothelium, so metabolic exchange, regulating the water content. 
highlight this regulating the water content. So numerous um, sodium, potassium, AT pumps that goes directly back to regulating water content because water follows sodium. And so those two um, sentences go hand in hand, but that is a very big thing. Um, it's, it's a very important thing for the eye. So highlight that, star it, remember it. Okay. So the sclera, just basic definition, what are we looking at? The big thing here is going to be um, the entry and exit for the nerves and vessels. This is very conceptual. You need to understand with um, the structure of the eye again. I'm saying that again, because I want you guys to hone in on that. Please understand the structure of the eye with respect to um, its function and all of the histology because it, it it's very, very important here. And it also it's gonna help you understand more um, in subsequent lectures. So the sclera, the very back, or not very back, because it's kind of offset, you have this lamina um, curvosa, which is the entry and exit point um, for the eye. Um, this is really big. You need to understand the iris, the ciliary body. Um, star this, this histo slide, extremely, extremely, extremely important. Um, you need to know all of the layers. You do. They, we, we were asked a handful of questions on these. So make sure you guys know the layers and associated with the functional aspect of it, right? Um, yeah. A lot of the concepts that you're seeing here is just tying into what you guys have learned from the past modules, right? You're seeing like layer two has like fenestrated capillaries. Like all of these things are important. You just don't know it until you get to term four and like term five, but like just hang tight. That's why yeah. they're spending so much time going over the choroid um, component. Yeah, so I would take the time, since this is very high, high yield and you will get a few questions from it, take the time and maybe draw out the layers so it hits for you. Um, again, Osmosis has a really good video over this, a really good um, visual about um, on it that made a lot of sense to me. Um, but you do need to know. So the fenestrated capillaries, um, Right here is big. And then um, this one has the sheet containing the five layers right here. Um, this picture, I can't, right here, star that. That might be something you see. Um, Knowing that the dilator um, pupillae is sympathetic versus sphincter pupillae is parasympathetic is gonna be very important for you. So highlight that as well. So the iris, the definition, um, it's really, it's separating the anterior and the posterior chambers. So um, I'm using this just to illustrate it. So, you, you know, you have the anterior chambers over here and the posterior chamber is gonna be behind it. Oh, no, come on, delete all. There we go. Accommodation, this is big. So you need to know the um, when the ciliary muscle is relaxed, that the lens is flat, that the fibers are tight and the lens are flat and the pupil is constricted. You need to know these. Um, it's a very high yield point, spend some time on it. So why, um, why is this important? Because it's how um, just near and far sightedness, but spend some time and understand that. Guys, that was one point I forgot. Um, we straight up had a question as like, Yes, the patient isn't able to see a object that's far away, like what is happening at the ciliary muscle versus like the 
zonular fibers. Remember, they're opposite in the case, right? Look at what is happening with the distant object. The ciliary muscle actually relaxes and the zonular fibers tighten in order to change the composition of the actual lens. So go through this, walk through the mechanism of it. I think it's often poorly explained. And when we when we were taught it, it's it's so hard, it's so abstract in its nature. But once you go through it, explain it why the actual fibers are doing what they're doing of flattening the lens, it's going to make sense, right? This is the conversation we had back in FTM where like they talk about like concave versus convex and why that changes the light refractory kind of capacity. So it's fun. Make sure you guys make it fun for this one because we got a straight up a question straight up from that chart that you're seeing there. Yeah, so I'll go over this quickly. So the ciliary muscle you're seeing here, the fibers you're seeing here. So this makes sense, right? If this is contracting, this is pooling. So these fibers right here are going to be very tight. So, you know, it's kind of pulling this out. It's going to be flat. Um, and so if, if you're shining something through um, something that's more flat, the light isn't going to be, you're not really going to... Um, yeah. Um, focusing it so you can see at a distance versus no, it's not gonna work. versus down here where the ciliary muscle is going to relax. Um, I said it opposite over here. I think relaxed is tightened, but that makes sense because if you relax, you kind of relax back. And so by the nature of the distance between the two, it's going to kind of pull on them. So it's going to relax back. So the fibers, you know, are going to try to keep, um, are going to pull right there by some bull um, physics. <laughs> but then if it contracts, then it's pulling in. And so the fibers are going to be able to relax a little bit because the ciliary muscle is um, contracted. I think I just confused you guys. Did I just talk in circles and completely mess you up? I misspoke. I sincerely apologize um, um, for that. But yeah, once you understand that, then you don't really have to think about it that much. It's like, oh yeah, it makes sense. Um, so um, check out what Kish just sent you guys. Okay, so remember um, I told you, you need to know the difference. You need to know which structure is the parasympathetic versus the sympathetic. Um, so that, so bright light parasympathetic neurons are going to stimulate the circular muscles. So you're going the sphincter pupillae, and so you're going to get constriction. Um, this, it, and then dim light synthetic. This makes sense because think about fight or flight. So if you are in a fight situation, so sympathetic system is um, um, stimulated, you want to be able to take in everything around you, right? So you're going to get dilation because you want to be able to, um, how do I want to phrase that? I don't know. But, but think of it that way versus the, um, yeah. Does that make sense? I don't know. I feel like how I'm understanding this is going to confuse you guys. I always take it back to like survival, right? Like when you guys are looking at your sympathetics versus your parasympathetics, right? You are in a life or death situation. You're about to take an exam soft exam, okay? Um, your pupils dilate because you're trying to assess as much information from the environment. So you're naturally going to make sure that the eye gets further light exposure, right? Things should be bouncing off of objects and getting into your eye so that you could make sense of what the environment is showing you, right? Whereas when you're in the parasympathetic state, it's purely like you are relaxed, life is good, you know, you're sipping a mojito, like fantastic time. So everything is parasympathetic in nature, right? So it stimulates this uh, in terms of like your kind of relaxation, right? It stimulates the circular um, muscles, right? Of the sphincter pupillae, um, 
to actually shut down, right? So therefore decreasing, it's a relaxation of the muscle so it can just go back to its natural state. That's important, right? And it changes here because you're contracting the muscles in the sympathetic portion to dilate the eyes. Um, it's a different muscle group, okay? Remember, there's a dilator pupillae, there's a sphincter pupillae. Sphincter, remember, it's the entire purpose in life, any sort of sphincter muscle you're thinking about is always to like, to tighten up and close so that it doesn't allow for overexposure of anything from one environment to the other. That's how I memorized this. I didn't like um, essentially whiteboard it or do anything for this one. I just said, look, am I surviving or am I like relaxing? Like that's that's what it comes down to with the dilator versus the um, dilator pupillae versus the sphincter pupillae. And it also, you can tie it back to like the pancos tumor, what happens when you have Horner syndrome. Like remember, your sympathetic nervous system on one side gets shut down. So one eye just goes all parasympathetic. Your, your pupils are super constricted. You're not sweating. Like all of this is a contribution and you guys can tie in that narrative and you guys can make it more fun than what they're just showing you on the slide. Thanks, Kesh. Got you. Okay, and then the ciliary body. So we just talked about this step up here, the ciliary muscle and the zonal fibers. So now we're getting a little more deep into it. So the ciliary muscle, smooth muscle under parasympathetic innervation. Um, so when we contract the muscles, we reduce the tension of the fibers. So if we like um, tense up, that means the fibers can then relax. And that's, um, that's kind of that mechanism there. Um, so when you do relax, um, but then uh, counter to that, you relax it, then it increases the tension to hold it there and you cause the lens to flatten. So um, I actually like these two sentences better than what was above, even though what was above was um, very laid out. Um, but I like these two sentences a lot because I think it um, does a good job at um, boiling it down. Okay, and these are the um, cilia process are the extensions and the body and the processes. Okay, it's not a huge thing there. Um, clinical correlate, anytime they do a clinical correlate here. So since the fibers are composed of, composed of fibrillin, there's a disease where we have, uh, you know, the Marfan syndrome. So remember, if you um, think back to FTM, where we were, them, they introduced Marfan syndrome, one of the symptoms that was very classic was the dislocation of the lens. Why do we have dislocation of the lens? Well, because there's composed of fibrillin. And so if we have the defect in fibrillin, then um, we don't have that structural integrity there. So that's why you see that um, symptom in Marfan syndrome. Okay. Big thing here are these two things. Um, so in the biggest, biggest thing is the canal of Schlen, which is going to be the scleral venous drainage, and um, which you are seeing right here, canal of Schlen. So know what that is and its function. That's gonna be the biggest thing here. This picture, do put a star on it. You need to know the orientation. You need to know what is posterior versus the anterior chamber. Um, uh, so that's why I keep harping on understand the anatomy, the structure of the eye so that you can get some of these questions right. I don't remember this being huge, huge. Oh, that I remember being something. Right, the glycos glycos. Yeah, the uh, glycos aminoglycans, that one was just generally important for the vitreous um, humor slash body. Remember the vitreous humor by itself is very more jelly-like. That's why it's like more so collagen and like connective jelly-like consistency. Whereas the aqueous humor, right? That's being produced at the ciliary epithelium. That's liquid, right? That's liquid. 
when you have a jelly-like consistency, you really can't have glaucoma with something that's already jelly in your eyes. It's always going to be the one that we covered above, right, in terms of the aqueous humor. That's the one that we often associate with, you know, acute angle versus, um, you know, open angle glaucomas. It's really important because when you guys get to term four, you're going to learn why, like, we spend so much time covering this, especially, and the drugs that we can give. That's why they spend so much time, especially SGU on why, on the Canelo Schlem, why it's tested heavily and why you got to know um, the clinical correlates with that. Yeah. Which just don't worry about too much. It's just, it's, yeah. it's hanging out. It's doing its thing. But, yeah. Just know this right now for your purposes that um, the glycosamine and the glycans. Okay. So we're coming back to this. Um, already kind of touched on the two basic layers, but the retina is huge, huge, huge because there's so much um, clinical application here. So you have the neural retina and the um, retinal pigment epithelium. Um, so you need to know this backwards and forwards. You need to need to need to sit down, um, kind of cross out everything here or, you know, copy paste this somewhere and then um, practice um, first of all, you need to know this orientation because if they flip this around, you need to know what you're looking at, but, um, make sure, you know, so pigment outer segment, outer limiting membrane, outer nucleus. So go through all of these, um, ganglion layer, optic nerve fiber, inner lining. I'll just tell you guys an exam question we had, um, right off the bat, Lindsay, if you can just jump back yeah, on that fair. slide. Um, if you guys remember, okay. Um, whenever you were talking about the cell body, right? It's a strong, it's a strong component. Everything is there. Like you're good, no problem. But when you're talking about the synapses, right? The synapses aren't too strong. They're not holding stuff together. So you can have detachment wherever you have synapses. So this is really important in that we got an exam question correctly asking which layer would be um, cut out, right? Like which one can quickly dissociate. So know that one very well. And that's how I remembered it. Whereas like anywhere you throw in a synapse, that's the likely location where you're gonna have um, any sort of detachment, whether it's the inner plexiform layer, outer plexiform layer, or even at the pigment epithelial layer, right? Because there's nothing that connects it properly. It's just stacked on top of each other. Yeah, they, they have one that they focus on though. So we'll talk about that in a sec, um, that, that's here. But rods and cones know which is which. So um, rhodopsin is the pigment here versus I iodops iodopsin here. So color blur versus black and white. Um, that's going to be your biggest thing with the rods and cones here. And then the retinal pigment epithelium. This is what's um, linked to retinal detachment. It might not. It, they might get. But they're probably going to give you the second order question in which they're going to give you this and they are going to label the layers and they're going to um, talk about someone with a retinal detachment and then say which of the following layers is involved in the pathogenesis and you're going to have to choose um, A, B, C, D or whatever layer. So make sure that, um, so that's going to be more here is the second and third order questions with respect to this. Um, so retinal detachment, of course, the biggest thing is just understanding that um, the link to the retinal pigment epithelium. So that's the biggest thing here. So the junction of that and um, the rods and cones layer. Um, optic disc, this is the blind spot where you see no cones and rods. And then the fovea, this is going to be the small depression in the center, um, highest visual acuity, contains only cones. This is really big to orient yourself to where you are in the eye. I vaguely remember a question that showed something along, um, I'll annotate this picture 
something like that. And then you, it's asking you directions like right versus left, either a lesion in the tract or something, but you have to look at this and know, is this a left eye or is this a right eye? And the way you know is the relationship um, between the fovea and the optic disc right here. So optic disc, is that going to be more medial or lateral? Medial. Yeah, optic disc is going to be more medial. So if you see this here, you know that you are, this is probably you're looking at a um, right eye. I mean, if, if the orientation is correct, which should be. But um, um, I don't think that I focused on that when I was studying. When I got to the exam, I noticed that I did have to look at an image like this and know if it was right versus left. And so in the moment I had to make that association, okay, how do I know that this is left versus right? So I'm just telling you guys from my experience, note that in your brain right now so that when you get to the exam and if you see something like this, you don't have to pause and make that association in the moment. You just already know um, that can be something that they focus in on. Um, so yeah, optic neuritis and muscle. Yeah. So another question. Yes. So if you see the optic disc on mm -hmm. the right, would that by itself tell you it's on the right, like our right? Yes. <laughs> I have to like orient myself. But yes, because um, since this is going to be medial, so you would you would like say the nose would, that's a terrible nose, but you would say the nose is right here because this would be medial. And so this would be your right eye because you're um, opposite of the patient. Yeah, so just to clarify, that's the patient's right eye. Yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't remember the lens histo being a huge thing. Do you, Kish? Held in place by the zonula fibers. So the big um, association with that is going to be accommodation. So, you know, ciliary muscle, zonula fibers, and then the lens. So if it's, if it's flattened versus if it's um, rounded, that's going to be a huge thing. But the... Um, so presbyopia, um, we'll touch on that when we go to that slide, but um, it's associated with um, sightedness and then the cataract, which is going to be the cloudiness. Yeah, lens cataract. Um, you guys talked about this in DM because you have the, um, the sorbitol. Okay. The glands, um, remember at the beginning where I um, told you guys the clinical presentations and then that picture where you have to know the glands, um, this is the big um, thing here. Also this, so the Mobian glands is gonna be the Chalazion, the glands of Zeiss is going to be a sty. Um, and then just the glands of mole, I guess that's how you say it, or the sweat glands of the lid margins, but the clinical correlates here are going to be the biggest thing on this slide right here. Okay, visual systems. Oh, so many interest slides. All right. So reviewing of the eye, we won't go through that because we just talked about the eye. So the anoptic disc, um, we defined those earlier. Yeah, so based off of Kish, there was a big discussion. Are they teaching him the, um, the red light thing anymore? Uh, they didn't for us for our, our term, but- um, I remember that was a really big thing. Brady and I spent a really long time on it and you guys yeah. ended up took it out of our lectures. We didn't even, yeah, we we just learned it off uh, off of your guys' review. So um, yeah, we didn't, we didn't get that. I don't know, did you guys get this for your term? Current and term twos? I'm, I'm mentally associating this with something else, but because um, um, 
but this just reminded me of it. I didn't know if it was in there. Okay, we'll just go through the slides. And if it's, um, if you guys don't have anything, then just let me know. Yeah, they they had this slide, but it seems they didn't cover the red light test, so. Okay, because I remember Brady and I spent a lot of time on that last time and you guys are like, oh, we don't have to. So I wasn't going to do that again, if you guys don't have that one. Okay, so, um, wow, there's a lot of words on this one. Okay, so there is a blind spot in your vision because there is a point, you know, in the back of your eye where you um, don't, it's um, where everything comes in and out. You don't have any rods or cones, so you can't see through that, but because of um, everything, your brain is essentially going to fill that in. So cortical fill in, it's going to fill in the missing information um, from the visual space. Okay, there's a point to this and I haven't seen it on the slides yet. Image information by the eye. Okay, this, we talked about accommodation um, with the ciliary muscle and the fiber. So yeah, I'm not gonna go over this. We went over this in the previous lecture. We went over accommodation, spatial two point discrimination. This wasn't. Kish, if you see something that you remember being high yield, stop me because I'm trying to find. We only had like eye correction stuff maybe thrown in there, but like overall this lecture was just to give you guys a perspective on yeah, like, like I, what's happening. I don't, okay, start this slide, this vision correction slide. Um, They broke the slide down previously, but I remember I think two questions yep. over this slide. So you have to understand hyperopia is um, nearsightedness. Myopia is, uh, I mean, hyperopia is farsightedness. Myopia is nearsightedness. And you need to understand um, the, um, everything about it. So eyeball is too short. So the image is actually gonna focus behind the retina. So it's gonna be blurry. So you are going to correct it by using convex um, lens versus nearsightedness, which is the eyeball is too long. So it's gonna be focused um, before the retina, get blurry vision. So you correct it with the concave lens. I think this is the biggest thing that I've seen so far in this lecture that you guys need to focus in on. So start this slide, the visual correct is like, oh, and then um, emetropia. So um, no vision problems. This is essentially the normal eye and that it just goes there. Pupil size, we talked about this already. So parasympathetic versus sympathetic, the dilator pupillae versus the, um, the uh, sphincter pupillae. What, what, what's it called? Yep. Yeah, sphincter pupillae. I was like, what? Yeah. Yeah, so sympathetic, parasympathetic, we already talked about that. This is just going over the exact same thing. So I'm not going to spend. Um, Don't worry too much on the nucleus of these things, guys. Um, that's okay. definitely an NB2 problem. Um, for now, just know that, you know, parasympathetic versus sympathetic, and you should be good. Sympathetic dilate, sympathetic. Yeah, this is just going over what we've already talked about. We've already talked about this. Um, so yeah, none of this is new. This is new. It just goes more into the photoreceptors, but that's still not. Oh, this was a thing.
we we honestly for this one it, it was a it, it felt like a tough concept but the important thing we honestly got tested on this was like how does rhodopsin get made and like that was a cumulative question actually that we got was like vitamin a like rhodopsin like carrots yeah. just eat your carrots and you should be okay <laughs> I love it. Just carrots. Yeah, all of this stuff. Oh, so many blue slides. Yeah, don't need to worry about like color blindness. That was probably covered in small group, but wasn't tested. So just letting you guys know. Endoscopy, maybe that was a thing you just had to know what it was and what you use, I think. And we already talked about um, how to tell if this is the right or left eye. So optic, this is gonna be in the nasal area. So medial, that's how you're gonna tell um, where you are. Oh, papilledema, I, I remember this being a thing. Um, so you will see swelling of the optic disc bilateral, increase ICP. Um, yeah, so papilledema, you have elevated disc margins. That's the big thing here. Retinal detachment, again, know the histological layer of this. Age-related macular de degeneration. This was a lot of review, honestly, from the last couple lectures. Okay. Visual pathways. Kish, I'm probably going to need your help on this one so that. Okay. The big thing here you need to understand, you need to take some time on this because depending on where the light rays are coming in are going to depend on um, where that goes in the pathway. So, um, you know, nasal versus uh, temporal. So you need to get good at um, kind of, I would drew it, draw it out for myself. So, the, so light coming, uh, we'll talk about that in a second, once we get to a better picture. <laughs> So essentially the visual field coming in is kind of flipped in your eye or on the back of your eye to um, take to your brain to actually process the information. So something, so you see that this is flipped right here. So the image that you're seeing, oh no, annotate, come on, why aren't you? The image that you're seeing right here is represented differently. It's gonna hit somewhere different on the back of your eye. So if it's, um, this is upper um, left. So I'm just using um, the actual direction on the, on the page here, the one dimensional is going to be lower right over here. Conversely, this is going, this is gonna kind of go that way blue is gonna go up there and then that's gonna go up there. So that's really confusing to people because if you think about how that's hitting the back of your eye and how it's traveling down the pathways to be sensed by the visual cortex, um, a lot of people get confused and you have to sit there and you have to think about it sometimes when you're doing these questions. So just, um, we'll go over, yeah. So this is what, um, I just talked about here. So it's it's essentially, if it's up, it's gonna be down. And if it's left, it's gonna be right with respect to where it's going to be sensed on the um, retina. Okay, so this is the picture that um, you will see very, often on here. So if you have this up here, it's going to come, you know, down into the left right here. So 
it's just, it's opposite. Just always know it's opposite right there when you are talking about um, the projection onto the retina. And then this comes full circle in a moment. Yes. So they're going to talk about what pathway is going to carry this particular signal to your visual cortex. And then at the visual cortex, everything is sensed into what you are perceiving. And so if you are, um, here we go. Kish, do you have an articulate way of saying this? Yeah, so let's, the way I kind of remember it is that it's coming back to a little bit of physics, right? When you're working with a lens, right? When image gets eventually process it has to be corrected right when you have a lens at the actual um if you were to take an image at the eye level and you were to look at anything it would be flipped your world would be upside down right now what your brain does uh like you know in in terms of your occipital lobe is that it corrects that image right it flips it to the right orientation it gives the right you know contextualization of the information as well as like processing Okay, if you guys remember that, you just have to do double correction, right? You would first do, um, in terms of understanding an image, at the eye level, it's upside down. When you get to the brain level, it realigns, but it has to do upside down again in order to recorrect it, right? And that that's my kind of complicated way of saying is like the occipital lobe, its entire function is to process eye um, input, right? And the location where it's going to go um, is highly reflective of what's happening. And you're going to see in terms of like visual fields, which location it goes to. And, and Lindsay will kind of run through it. And if, if you guys need, I'll try to hop in as well. Yeah. So I'm going to not talk about this part real quick. And we're just going to talk about the sensory um, pathway from the retina. So if you are ending up on the temporal side right here, which means it was originally nasal. So remember, everything's opposite. So we're ending up on the temporal side. It was originally nasal, but this is what we're talking about. So its track is going to run here and it's going to run like this. So temporal coming here like that. Now, if you have the nasal side, so originally temporal, it's actually gonna come and it's going to cross right here. You've probably seen this image many times. And then this right here is called the optic chiasm. And all of this matters when we talk about um, visual field deficit. So we're just kind of talking about the basics right here. So, this is medial um, versus lateral, nasal versus temporal. And then when you're talking about up versus down, again, opposite, um, you are talking about different radiation. So the temporal radiation versus the inferior radiation. So if you have something that is reflected onto the retina on the inferior side, it's going to go the um, temporal tract versus if you have something that's reflected on um, the superior part of the retina, it's going to go the parietal tract. Um, so that's the basic of the tracks there. And then you can see that when you end up in the primary visual cortex, um, you have the different just um, anatomical locations of the brain. So lingual gyrus versus um, the cuneus right here. So um, there, there are different tracks to the visual cortex based off of where the image is in your site. So now I'm going to oh, eraser, bring this back in because we've talked about how it goes. So again, if no, draw, here we go. If you are again, just opposite, if you, if you originate temporal up, 
you are going to be nasal down. If you originate temporal down, you're going to be nasal up. And if you originate uh, nasal up, temporal down, if you originate navel, nasal down, temporal up. And then that's how you are going to know where it's going to travel, how it's going to travel to the um, visual cortex. Yeah, so that's just pretty much what we were just talking about. Okay, so I'm going to refer back to this image. So we're saying that the superior was, it's saying it's ending up here. Oh, nope. I wish it had this image over there, but it doesn't. I'm sorry, guys. Lingual gyrus cuneus. I wanted to. Um, oh, it does have it there. I'm just not paying attention. Um, so this is temporal up, so it's going to be nasal down. So this is actually coming here, and since it's um, nasal, it's actually crossing down here. Since this is inferior, it's actually going to go on the inferior one, and it's going to end up here. That's why you get to that specific location. So talking about um, how you might see it on the test question, it um, you it could talk. It could show you a visual field where it lands and then where is this going to be sensed in the um, visual cortex. And so you'll also see here, since this is on the side nasal up, it's going to be temporal down. And this is actually going to travel this way as well. It's going to travel with the exact same pathway as this right here. So these are traveling in the same pathway, even though it's being sensed um, by both of your eyes. The way I remember these guys um, is by the actual disorder or like the presentation yeah, okay. of it, because you're going to drive yourself nuts trying to like logic your way through every single pathway for this. Just practice based off of the disorder, right? Like the example that we're given here, right? This is um, superior left quadrantinopia, right? Um, if, if quadrantinopia happens, and if it's only in the one quadrant, then what gets affected, it is the lesion of the optic radiation, especially the one that's going to the inferior por portion yeah. of the hemisphere. So if they ask you questions like that, you can be like, mm, okay, so I'm looking likely at a lingual gyrus being messed up or the optic uh, radiation going to it that's messed up. So make sure you guys learn it based off of that way. Otherwise, it's fairly an arduous challenge just to kind of go through it um, with the entire visual system in one go. Yeah, so there are three places where you can, um, or three umbrellas of which you can get a lesion optic nerve, the optic chiasm, and then the radiation. So at this past optic chiasm, essentially anything that is going to affect this area can, so, you know, the nucleus, the radiation, um, but optic, nerve and we'll go over this really quickly if it's the optic nerve right here are you going to see this in one location no because you have nerves coming this way and a nerve coming this way so depending on what you're affecting and i know this isn't making much sense now you guys have a chart at the end of this lecture i think it's the end of this lecture where it I maps it out for you but i just wanted to talk about why you're going to see the pathology that you're going to see is because it's optic nerve versus optic chiasm versus the optic radiations which includes the um the nucleus and the radiations and then of course the gyri back here and so that's the basis of the um, questions that's going to be the basis of the pathology here is do you know at which point of this tract essentially of this pathway is being affected and so i don't think i need to go through each of those so visual cortex area 17 um the calcerin solosis that's not the most important part yeah so this is the primary visual cortex 
Um, you'll see it when you have that big chart. Again, this is just preparing you guys, giving you the context of the big chart. But a big, big, big high yield thing is the difference between if you have the um, central vision versus the peripheral vision, because sometimes they'll distinguish between the two. Um, sometimes you will have just the generation of your central vision, and that is a specific place. So you need to know that there is a difference there. We've kind of talked about this, um, the way it travels. So um, back of the retina coming up to the nucleus and then whichever ray is going to, um, to get to the visual cortex. I'm trying to get to the meat of this. This is huge, 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 huge. That table is high yield, guys. If you guys pay attention to that table, it'll give you essentially everything that um, yeah. myself and Lindsay have kind of gone through. Super star, bold, committed to memory because- the This is lesions, the basis of the whole lecture. Yeah, the lesions the are what is gonna be tested lecture. on. Like they love it. They love these lesions. So. No, like I mean, we got a straight up question on bitemporal hemianopsia, and the only way I remember that it affects the temporal lobe or the temp, like the temples or like the sides of your face, is because of the fact that we learned pituitary adenoma back in the day, right? So, like, reason your way through these. Um, they didn't get very detailed in terms of like, you know, what um, nucleus is affected, but they did ask us a question as like, where is the lesion located, right? That's why if you look at like that chart, that um, the summary chart, where it shows like the optic chiasm being affected, right? So what's the likely cause of it? Pituitary adenoma, right? Tumor. Um, if it's an optic tract, then you can get homogeneous hemianopia, right? Like that's only affecting um, one tract, right? And you can work you through work through your um, notes and explain these and know the lesions. You should be good, right? Don't sit there memorizing the entire visual pathway. I guarantee you, like the Krebs cycle, you're gonna forget it. Yeah, um, the biggest thing is knowing the pathway in general, knowing the different areas, so optic nerve versus chiasm versus the, um, the nucleus tracks, all of that. And then this is what it's associated with because this is the basis of the, um, like this is clinical, this is the clinical application of it. So star that, memorize it. Yeah, they do love the bitemporal hemianopsia. So this brings it back to what I was saying, the sign of the lesion. So optic nerve versus the chiasm versus the tract. Um, what are you going to see here? Um, so that's big. So um, we already talked about this. We talked about the importance of it. So I'm not going to go over it again, um, but you can peruse it. Eye movements, I think this starts where you guys are, what you guys are talking about next week, is that correct? I don't think eye movements was in week three. I think you guys have it coming up. Okay. So that was your DLA. Oh, so many blue slides. <laughs> Guys, if you haven't, go and watch or play around with that link that they gave you in one of the blue slides above. That shows you the exact cranial nerve, every muscle that could be affected, as well as um, how it'll present if you were to take a visual assessment of a patient, right? Whether it's a, you know, oculomotor, trochlear versus abducens, it can tell you right off the bat. And that that test of the H test, it's also shown in that link. So. Um, this was an SGU provided kind of example. So make sure you guys covered that um, because it will give you some clarity on this whole conjugated versus unconjugated kind of movements when you see it in a pathological state versus um, when you guys cover like, you know, overall cranial nerves and motor movements of the eye. Kish, are you good at eye movements? Are you good at these tracks? 
Uh, I used to be back in the day. <laughs> so was I. That's the thing is this is such a like a heavy concept. And I remember knowing it so well back in the day, but I feel like this is like the crab cycle. You always have to like reorient yourself to this. Correct. Um, and the way I, I went about it is by breaking it down into two components, right? One cover in terms of like the actual muscle movement. And then the other is based off of how you would perform the age test to isolate one particular muscle and movement. If you guys can do it that way, and I've thrown some links in the chat about like the eye movements, you should be good. Um, I'll also upload one of the external resources that I have on the eye movement. It's a very long video. It's about 30 minutes, but he covers all of this plus more. Um, it's like Dr. Najib's lectures on eye movement. So like you'll you'll see it. I'll, I'll make a little post about it. Okay, the biggest thing that I feel like we need to touch on here um, is this. Are you good at this, Kish? Uh, I, I mean, when I, when I learned this, I covered it based off of the fact that um, the disorders and how it looks, um, the midbrain pons and the cerebellar and the involvement of that, that is, once again, that was covered heavily in NB2. The nuclei and all of these things, PPRF, that's the part that was often asked about in terms of conjugating the um, eye movements. Um, I'm going to try to explain it um, in terms of how you would see it, um, and we'll, we'll kind of take it from there. Obviously, if I don't do a good job, I'll, throw, I'll, I'll put some external resources for you guys to kind of um, address that. Our previous, oh, here is what I was looking for. The previous that review one. had a really good ex, um, explanation of this, I think. But the um, saccadic eye movements, the MLF, and then the RPF or whatever it is, that's very high yield on this exam, FYI. Okay, Kesh. All right, um, I'll try this. Okay, we'll see how it goes. Um, the important thing like to kind of start off, um, your eyes have to work literally in the opposite direction in order to track visual objects in space, right? That's why one pathway has to be active and actively um, synchronizing the movement of the non dominant eye, right? Like, let's say your eye needs to go to the right hand side, right? Your right eye is going to activate the abducens nerve, right? So that your right eye can go that direction. But remember, you another portion of the brain has to signal to the left eye, hey, we're tracking an object that's going to the right hand side, please activate the oculomotor portion. And how that's done is by two essential um, nuclei. Well, technically three, but um, we can kind of address that. Now, remember, your eyes have to, uh, uh, correction for this comes from the brain itself, right? Through the PPRF, as well as um, partially by activation of the abducens nuclei, as well as the oculomotor. Right. You guys see how this is a um, bipolar neuron, right? The cell, the actual cell body is located in the abducens nuclei, and it goes and stimulates the oculomotor nuclei to move the eye towards the right hand side, right, of the left eye. That's important to understand that, that the signal can come from this as well, so that you can shut down from the brain level the abducens nerve so that it doesn't go in opposite direction. That's how I generally understood it. Um, as an overall concept. Now let's kind of work through the lesions so that you can understand how it can go wrong. And this show like that brain slices, we weren't tested on the brain slices, FYI, like the exact ones, don't worry about it. Um, I highly doubt it they're gonna get that specific because that'd be like, you know, if you wanna become like an ophthalmologist, like you can take a board exam on that. <laughs> Yeah, so the big thing here is diplopia. Dip, diplopia. I can't. I can never say that word. Oh, y'all don't have that. No red eye test for you guys. Yeah, no red eye test. So let's say we there have a, a trick, but you guys don't have this. Okay, here we go. Yes, that one. So the lesions. If you guys are seeing the lesions, 
Um, and it, it tells you what's happening, right? Each step of the way, it, it's being shown. Let's say there's a PPRF lesion on the right-hand side. What can you not do, right? This is on the same side. So your eyes can't go to that specific direction. If you have a right PPRF lesion, your eyes can't go to the right. It's as simple as that, right? It gets a little bit more complicated when you're talking about MLF, right? MLF is involved more so with um, making sure that, well, MLF plus PPRF, you're basically only allowed <laughs> allowing the left eye to go one direction. And obviously this is important because you need to think about it in terms of what nuclei is affected, as well as what eye movements can and can't do, right? Because they can ask you either way. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, we didn't have too many questions on this. We got like maybe three, maybe four total. Um, but MLF, right? If there's a lesion on it, what's what what is it can what's the presentation of it? The patient's eye can only go to the left hand side, right? Of the left eye, because the actual eye movement is down regulated by the activity of the fact that you don't have an MLF, right? You're just not there, it's not functional. So it prevents the adduction of the right eye. So the patient would basically only have their left eye going to the left direction. That's it, right? There's no conjugated movement or movement that is synchronized with each other. The PPRF component isn't gonna allow to go on the same side. MLF opposite, PPRF, same side. That's how I remembered it. That's how Brady taught it to us as well. Remember, PPRF, if it's on the right-hand side, your eyes can go to the right, right? And if it's on the left-hand side, it can go to the left. Keep it simple that way so that you guys don't confuse yourself too much like how I just did. MLF yeah. lesions, it's the opposite, right? Your eyes um, can't go to the opposite direction, right? MLF lesion on the right, your eyes can't um, go to the left, right? Yeah, specifically, I think you that very well. Sorry, go on. Specifically the right eye, right? It's whenever you have an issue, it's going to affect the same eye when you're talking about MLF, right? This is the tricky part. I made literally a table... Um, which I can't for the life of me find, but I, if, if I can reproduce it, I'll try to send it to you guys. MLF lesions, it's going to affect the same side eye and it's going to prevent the directional movement of the opposite side. So like your right eye, let's say you have a right MLF lesion, your right eye is the one that's affected and it can go to the left. You guys see, make a little table, three columns, simple as that. Okay, and run through each situation so that you guys can understand it. Whereas a PPRF, it's going to affect both eyes, but it's going, it's, it's preventing the movement of the eyes to the site of the lesion. Okay, so your eyes, if it's on the right side, you have a lesion on the PPRF, it can go to the right. Simple, easy, nothing too crazy. Once you guys make that table, you will be solid. I wish I was sitting with you when I was trying to do this because I was trying to map this out and that is a very good simplification. Use that simplification because when you see those clinical presentations, you're gonna be like, oh no, and you're gonna to try to map out the actual tracks in your head, which is what I tried to do, which took a really long time on the exam to answer the question. Because uh, you guys don't have time to run through that entire logic. So I learned it based off of that quick trick um, it's not the proper way of learning, but I'm just going to say like, it will get you the score that you need on those questions. Well, understand the concept, like look at the track and understand the concept. But once you understand the concept, just learn the trick, like learn the simplification because that is what you need for the exam. But if you understand the concept, I mean, it'll, it'll help you, but, um, I just, so, I, I didn't simplify it. So on the exam, it took me a really hard, long time to answer these questions. So Kish simplified it very well for you guys. I would take that and use his advice because I didn't do that when I was going in your shoes. Remember the PPRF component, it's coming from the actual like lobe that's involved with your conjugated eye movements, et cetera. Okay. So um, the MLF is more so along with what is down reg regulating versus activating with your eyes um, coming from the um, actual 
nerve that's stimulated. So just keep that in mind. It wasn't a question, but I just wanted to like clarify on that concept so you guys can remember. The ears were actually kind of big, so I would pay attention closely to this um, when Lindsay goes over. Yeah. Histo was big on this in the I already said that, but I just wanted to reiterate that here. Um, my hair keeps getting in my face because the fan's blowing on me. Um, so understand the difference between external, middle, and internal ear because infection is very important and innervation is very important with respect to the different areas. Um, so this EM picture is very important. Um, specifically, I want you guys to focus on the nerves. Know which is vestibular and know which is cochlear. I'm going to say that again, know which is vestibular and know which is cochlear and because both of those are going to have different clinical presentations and you're going to need to know it. So just hint there. So the tympanic membrane, so this is just orienting you um, external acoustic meatus versus the um, tympanic cavity right there. Again, there was a very good osmosis video over the ear stuff that clarified it so well for me. Um, so big thing here, bony labyrinth, you have the paralymph versus the membranous lab labyrinth, which is the endolymph here. So know the difference between those two. Um, I don't remember this being a thing, the, con the um, concentrations here, you just need to know um, paralymph versus endolymph in their locations. Okay, receptors. So vertigo, this is talked about in a subsequent lecture. So just understand that vertigo here, um, it is associated with the vestibular labyrinth versus cochlear, the clinical um, correlate is going to be more sense of neural hearing. Um, vertigo we'll talk about in a sec because it um, has to do with the different ways the, um, the lymph is going to circulate in there depending on the head movements. Krista Ampularis, this, um, it's, sensory for angular motion of the head. So depending on how you move, the fluid is also going to move. And when the fluid moves, it's going to displace um, the hair cells. And so that's how you um, get signals from there. That's the big thing here. So the, um, Did they cover this? Um, this um, they're gonna cover it this week, right? Like yeah, this stuff? week. Okay, I'm gonna tell you guys one thing. Um, with the ears, the foundation of what you guys are gonna understand with like Glasgow Coma Scale and all of this starts off with this information. So, um, I want you guys to make it your personal mission to learn this one well because we did get a couple of questions on this based off of like both normal versus abnormal, right? In terms of like if patients coma, comatose and you're putting cold water in the ears versus warm water, um, it starts off with the basic knowledge that you're learning here. Um, know that one, when you're moving your head, right? One ear is down-regulating activity because the way, um, Lindsay, if you can scroll up, I forget the name of the actual structure. Um, yes, these type one, go down, sorry. This one, sorry. Yeah, the the type one hair cells um, and the actual, you know, the projections, the stere the stereocilia are really important because when they when one ear sways to the left or the right, one ear actually shuts down. The other ear gets activated because um, this is you guys will cover this, you know, when you get to the later slides, but it's important because that's what we're hijacking to test a patient's like sense of consciousness, right? This is the whole, like, you know, um, your, your sense of movement and space. So 
learn the type one and type two hair cells very well because they are the foundations for the all of these, you know, cold test versus hot test. Yeah. I stopped myself from talking about it right there because I know the slides are in another lecture and it's like, I'm just going to talk myself in circles. <laughs> but if you, um, this is going to be more conceptual, I'm just um, orienting you guys. You notice that these hair cells, the orientation of the projections is different. So you have kind of the split here. This is very important in your perception because um, depending on where, um, the movement, it's going to activate differently. And so I'm just telling you guys conceptually, just, just for your own edification, under, notice that. Notice that there is a difference right here in the orientation of these cells. Um, this was a high yield slide right here, um, knowing the different compartments and knowing the importance of the different compartments. So the scala media has, uh, contains the spiral organ of corti. So that is very important here. Actually, for, for our term, they actually asked us what what would you see there, endolymph versus perilymph? Um, if you guys can remember what is associated with each location, right? Like the nice thing is they're kind of sandwiched, right? Like the scala, like whatever, the cochlear duct, I can't pronounce, pronounce other words, um, we know this. Um, that's associated with endolymph, right? And sandwich around it is the uh, perilymph. So if you guys can remember that, you guys can get those, basic like histology questions right off the bat. That's like their favorite um, because it, it deals with pathological states. You're gonna learn in like term five. <laughs> <laughs> Everything relates back to that. Okay, so the hair cells they talk about later. Okay, sound perception. <laughs> They talk about this later too. That's why I keep stopping myself from saying anything because it's all touched on in subsequent lectures. Okay, conductive hearing loss versus sensorial hearing loss. This is a big, 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 big thing. Not this particular slide later, but I just want you guys to prepare yourself because if you haven't, you guys haven't done these lectures before. And so I want you guys to know that the difference between conductive versus sensorial hearing loss and how you know which is which, um, the test that you do is very important um, for this exam. So I just wanted to preface that um, your next lectures and when they start going over that, just understand that it's going to be a big thing. Okay, again, Hang loves to put these on here and then give you guys a lot of good information on it. Um, so, um, Yes, you need to know these. We don't uh, have those on our slides. Oh, you don't? Do you guys have this lecture? Up Rosa until that week. point. It's coming up this week. Okay, yeah. So this is just kind of a preface to what you guys are doing this week. Um, so, I, so again, I'm just going to hit some points that I want you guys to focus on when you're listening to his lecture. So again, he loves to put these slides up there and he loves to speak about these. Um, so pay attention to the information that he's giving you when he is on these slides because it is going to be very high yield for you. Okay. This is high yield. Remember when um, we were looking at that histo image and I said, you need to understand the difference between external and middle internal ear because of innervation. This is big thing. So innervation of the oracle. So this is the outside of the ear right here. You need to understand which is which. So the posterior two thirds right here is going to be the great auricular. So yes, C2, C3, you need to know that. And the anterior one third right here is going to be the auriculotemporal nerve. I highlight this, star it, do whatever you need to do. That is a very um, high yield point here. So the slide is really just going over sensory innervation of the um, most external part of the ear, the oracle.
This was um, high yield as well. So a pre-auricular sinus due to incomplete fusion of the primitive tubercles. Um, so star of that, I remember that being um, focused on. So this is just, that's the same thing. Let's talk about the same thing. Then, okay. So auditory tube, uh, external ear, middle ear, auditory tube. This is good to the pharynx. So they love to ask questions about um, the connection between the, um, the draining and a pathway for possible infection. So if you have a throat infection, there's a direct tube towards the ear. So you can have, um, you can have an infection that goes to um, your ear, goes to your pharynx. And so that's a clinical correlate that, that they like to focus on. Can't talk. Okay, so external acoustic meatus, we talked about the oracle, now we're going into the um, actual ear. So um, innervation, auriculotemporal nerve, um, except for a small area that is going to be um, cranial nerve 10. Um, you guys talk, we'll talk about the cough reflex. Um, I don't know if it's, it's probably an NV2. Um, so I forget I said that, but auriculotemporal nerve is very important um, here. This is that innervation. Again, very high yield point. Um, middle ear. I would be sort of familiar with this. I don't remember that being a super high yield point that you need to understand right now. Just understand that, you know, sound is transmitted due to vibrations in these. Um, and so you have it on your um, eardrum and then you have the bones and that are connected to one another and then right here the stapes you'll see this familiar I'll annotate this familiar structure from the histo this this has all of those canals with all of those hair cells that we're going to talk about I think in the next lecture but this is it you have the um vibrations coming in here so it stimulates your eardrum so you have essentially just this wave coming through here and what it does is it stimulates the fluid inside of these canals to start vibrating so the vibrating of it is going to activate those hair cells the hair cells are going to send the signal to the nerves and then that's how you are going to get the um, sensation of sound that's how you're going to perceive sound right there Um, to panic membrane, again, innervation is always a very high yield point, especially since you're in neuro. Um, so the external surface of, uh, is the auriculotemporal nerve, except for a small area of um, CN7 and 10. And then internal surface is um, nine. So what that means is, um, the part that is on the outside. Just the inside. Okay. Yeah, eustachian tube, this is the big thing for the um, path of an infection. Well, this one is actually kind of important when you guys look at the embryological origin. Lindsay, if you go one slide down, I think the malleus down and like this or this. That one, that one. The okay. when you guys cover the malleus incus and stape, uh, stapes, you got to know your arches. Remember when we covered the pharyngeal arches, um, you know, grooves, whatnot, those are tested based off of this. So I'm, I'm telling you guys it's really important that you guys know the um, arches for these for that particular reason they're not going to ask you like where does life begin and what's the greater meaning of life and like they're going to keep it very simple with this malleus incus first arch don't get it twisted with like grooves and whatnot it's arch okay first arch arch okay keep it arched that should begin stapes has to come from the secondary and it's really important that you guys know this because of the fact that the muscles associated with them now when i'm talking the reason why like you know you know whenever a lecturer is giving a lecture and like you get auditory feedback right that's because sound is going back into the mic 
that you've already projected out. That's why like when you set up an audit, uh, like an auditory system, you have to have sound dampeners and the location of them has to be appropriate. The tensor tympani versus the stapedius muscle um, are all focused in on making sure they dampen the sound when you're actually speaking, right? So that's why technically my, my mom always says this, when you're talking, you're actually not listening to someone, right? Um, it's a kind of a real metaphorical joke, but the important thing to note with that is uh, the stapedius, right? When you're um, in terms of innervation versus the tensor tympani, those are associated with the facial nerve as well as um, I think the trigeminal, I think. But don't quote me on that. Make sure you guys learn those cranial nerves because that was um, associated with them and why when you're speaking, your facial muscles are moving. So one of the muscles is gonna tense this part of your inner, or sorry, middle ear. And another portion is going to be active when you're actually using um, a different part, like your mouth. I think so that was really big in NB2. Yeah, that uh, that NB2. might be an NB2 concept. So make sure you guys um, keep that in mind. But the arches definitely, most definitely is going to come up for this exam. There you go, chordae tympani nerve. I always forget the particular nerve, name of the nerve, but um, these weren't too crazy. Um, you just needed to know like what are the bones of the middle ear. I think we got a couple of anatomy questions on that. Um, remember the afferent sensory portion, two thirds of your tongue. That's why when your tongue moves, you can have the chordae tympani activated. Um, that's going to work on the muscle level and help you further dampen sound, right? Because I feel like this was more in B2 though. Yeah. Did they Shoot, test look. it in NB1? We, we had one question on it. That's why I was like, I oh, okay. only reason I remembered it was because of the fact that I covered it so unnecessarily in detail. <laughs> in detail. Because I feel like they're just like getting a taste of some of these things that go hard in NB2. Yep. Um, for this one, guys, I'm going to tell you, you got to literally take the Sakai picture that they give you. It's literally a one document take it, print it out. I, I, I'm a firm believer of not printing anything in life because you got to save the Amazon, but you have to really make sure you guys make this box, okay? Um, whether you have to draw it out or understand it via some method, you have to. You have to do it, okay? Um, because they have questions on this. This is definitely an NB1 tested thing. It will come back again in NB2, okay? Um, the key thing is you're looking into the ear. This is what I was talking with Brady the other day, or actually before this session, the perspective of what you're looking at the box is coming directly from the understanding that you're looking into the ear. If you have that orientation, everything else changes, right? Every, every other position gets rewired, okay? Um, make sure you guys start off with that orientation, and if they switch up things, then you would be good. That's your starting off point. Um, I think... Yeah, in terms of the box, it's purely memorization. What they did ask us about is um, the muscles, right? In terms of like what is, you know, eventually dampening sound. That's once again, an NB2 concept that's heavily tested. But for now, you just need to know like um, there's a particular muscle that, you know, dampens sound. And if you, if you guys go through this, you'll, you'll understand it quickly. All right. Yep, tympanic plexus is formed by the, and you need to know cranial nerve nine. That's really important. Um, tympanic nerve is an offshoot of that. Anytime they honestly talk about a nerve and all of this stuff, it's probably going to be tested quite honestly. Yep. This is the facial nerve. Like I told you guys, this one comes back up so often, okay? Um, because when your face is involved with speaking, you have to shut down a portion of your inner ear, right? Inner and middle ear have to be kind of shut down. So that's why the internal acoustic meatus um, is really, really like their favorite go-to for testing um, cranial nerve seven and eight. Um, so like I said, when we were talking about the eye, if a nerve goes through a specific area, it's important. Why is it important? Because that area can get damaged and then you can get nerve damage. And so something that they love to talk about is 
um, there is a collapse of this or an injury here or um, something and what nerve is affected, what artery is affected. And so that's why I circled that. They like to focus on that. And this is another view of, this is the box this is the, um, that we were talking about earlier. Make sure you guys go through this because this concept is quintessential and you will see it again in NB2 and they love asking questions about this. For now, just know that tympanic plexus, Lindsay was, is absolutely right. There's very few muscles that are actually tested for NB1. So stick with the plexus, stick with the nerves, the basic nerves that you're working with. The muscles will cover it when um, you guys get to that point. I already talked about that. Inner ear, um, so again, nerve, um, cranial nerve eight, so two sensory divisions. Um, so remember back in that EM picture when I told you to know which of which was the vestibular portion, which was the cochlear portion. The reason is, you know, if you if you sever cranial nerve eight, you can have um, deficit of both, but sometimes you can only sever one branch of it. And so how are you going to know which branch it is hearing versus the equilibrium and balance? And so um, that's a second or third order question that they can ask with that EM picture, but just understand that there are two branches. They do two different things. Okay. Yeah, we, we didn't get anything else after that, like that all of the stuff that was anatomy from that was not tested. So um, the ones that we went over the box, as well as the knowing just the cranial nerves associated with that. Very, very important. I'm just going to emphasize that. Mm -hmm. This is what Kish was just talking about. So sound attenuation, you have two muscles that are limiting the accession, excessive, excessive pressure. Um, you just remember as those sound waves are coming in and they're being transmitted through the bones to um, vibrate the fluid to activate the hair cells. But if you are in a loud area, um, it can actually damage. And so you have the attenuation, so contraction of, um, tensor tympani and um, the stapedius. And so that is a very important thing. It's like a reverb guys. It's, um, it, it's kind of, I, I learned it based off of like sound systems. Like, you know, like when you, when, when you hear echo um, and you guys are gonna cover this later on, but like some of the infections that you can get in the middle ear can actually present with like echoey nature, right? Like it sounds like you're getting feedback and it, it's, cool, but like for the time being, I think it helps understanding the basic concept that it comes back to the cranial nerves, vestibular, as well as um, the cochlear component. Yeah. Okay. So this is when it's talking about um, the organ of corti and it's actually getting into the physiology of the hair cells. So remember the scalar media has the organ of corti. This is a really big um, thing. Just know where it is. This has the endolymph. Remember the different kind of fluid. And so um, endolymph. Okay. So it's, we're specifying high potassium here. So the hair cells, this is the big thing here. Um, depending on what direction the fluid is going, so what way you're turning your head, is going to determine how the fluid flows and um, um, the, its association with this membrane right here. And so the hair cells, which way it's going to go. So remember, Kiss talked about how, you know, if it goes one way, it can be activated. If it goes another way, it can be inhibited. And that's what you're getting here. It's the direction of the fluid motion, it's directed direction of its association with the tectorial membrane um, is going to depend, um, you know, if the hair cells are going this way or if the hair cells are going this way. And that's going to send signals down here different types of signals. And um, that's how you're going to get your activation of the cranial nerve at that point. Um, 
Um, so again, tectorial membrane, the movement of it. So why do we care that there's MDO limb high in calcium? Well, because depending on what way the hair cells move, you are going to get an influx of um, calcium, which are going to depolarize the cell, depolarizing the cell. Guess what? You get um, the transduction. And so um, basilar membrane deflected up, then you get the influx. Um, versus down where you are no influx, so it's hyperpolarized. So that's um, essentially, you're not getting any signal transduction there. So that's the big thing here. So up, you get the influx, down, you do not get the influx. So it's hyperpolarized. I remember spending so much time on that and I just blew through that in like a minute because it just makes so much more sense now. Um, so, which means it will make sense to you. That's why I said <laughs> there is hope. I just want to make sure you guys take it to the fundamental, because like when Lindsay covered it and we've covered it multiple times, so we understand it very quickly, but what you need to understand is that these are exposed neurons, right? These are cells. These are like straight up like central nervous system like cells. So it makes sense why the endolymph is very similar to CSF, right? Um, because remember, potassium drives a lot of the conduction in your central nervous system and your brain. So that's why in the tectorial membrane, as well as what you see in the endolymph, it's similar to um, intracellular fluid, right? Your CSF, um, et cetera. So, and once again, tying broad concepts together to very hone in on the clinical aspect you have summation. This is the reason why you covered summation because a portion of the ears on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, depending on how they move, it's either going to have a majority of down regulation, which is like shutting down of one ear. Um, and it depends on the summation, right? It's not just one thing. There's not just one side that's excited. In, es in essence, it is, but it's dealing with summation once again, like neurons. Yeah. Also, it's kind right. of fun to remember endolymph as like endo and then peri is in the peripheral. So you can imagine endo being the center, right? In endo versus peri. Okay. So inner ear amplification, so it's just the amplification of the actual signal. So um, hyperpolarized, expanded, depolarized, compressed. Um, so we're amplifying low intensity sounds here. So it, the basilar membrane will deflect upwards and the ha hair cells are depolarized, outer cells are compressed and um, the basilar membrane um, is pulled further upwards versus um, oh it's talking about the outer versus, versus the inner hair cells right there That is a very scary picture. Please do not focus. Do not learn it, please. No. You're going to no, only no. cry. All, your lacrimal glands are going to be overactive. Yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Um, yeah. The bit here, this is what I was talking about here. This is, this is the most high yield point in this entire lecture. Um, conductive versus sensor and neural hearing loss. Um, why is this important? Because conductive is going to be pretty much with the, it's going to be more of an obstruction versus sensorineural. It's an actual issue with the um, system of the ear. So conductive, you just can't get it through. Sensorineural, you can get it through, but you're not actually getting the sensation there. So that's the difference between, and we can tell the difference with the physical exam, which is which, and yes, um, you will be tested on that in here. So how do you do that? There are two tests. You're gonna start with the Weber's test and you guys are gonna get into that this week, but I'm gonna go over it very briefly here. Um, step one, Weber's test, first step. 
Um, they, it isn't two separate tests. You do one after the other. So Weber's 512 Hertz um, tuning fork. You put it at the center right here. It's showing it kind of back here, but it um, you can do it right here. And so if it's equal, we're good, but if it lateralizes, if you have a lateral lateralization of Weber's, that's when you know that there's, um, you can have a hearing loss. Um, so again, figuring out conductive versus sensorineural. So if Weber's lateralizes, then you can do another test. It's called the RINS test. So lateralization, it, it means that you hear it louder on one side. Um, okay, so if you, if it lateralizes, okay, is it going to be conductive or sensorineural? So you can do the RINS test. So if it's, if it lateralizes to one side, the sensor, sensorineural loss will lateralize to the unaffected side. But if it's conductive, it's going to lateralize to the effective side. So if you have, um, um, there, there's kind of a chart in a minute that'll tell you. So the RINS test, you are going to put it right behind the ear. You're going to do the same thing, 512 hertz tuning board, to put it right here. And then um, you are going to essentially ask, tell me when you can't hear it. So the patient's like, I can't hear. And then you move it to the side of the ear. And then it's, you're essentially timing the difference between when they can hear it when it's on the mastoid bone versus when it's right here. And so that time difference is what you're going to use right there. Um, so um, normal is air conduction is going to be um, longer than bone conduction. So bone conduction is at the mastoid, air conduction is if it's right here. So remember you are, um, are timing this and seeing if there's a difference between the two. Air conduction should be longer than bone conduction. So if, um, um, so if on a side bone conduction is longer, then it's going to be a conductive hearing loss, which makes sense because if you have it on the bone and you can still hear it, versus if it's um, if you're testing the air conduction out here, then it's going to be a conductive hearing loss because you were able to sense it because of the vibration of the mastoid, which is causing um, the vibration in the system and you can hear it versus air conduction um, for both on one side deeply. So if there is a, um, but times for both on one side, if there's a decrease, if there's a difference between these two, then it's sensorineural hearing loss. But if it, so you see up here, it's air conduction versus bone conduction, but that's normal. But if it's different between left versus right, that you know that there is a sensorineural hearing loss in the one that has, um, that's decreased. I hope that made sense. I don't know if that made sense. Um, just remember with this guys, um, Lindsay did a fantastic job, but like what you need to remember with this is essentially is that the RINS test is the one that essentially gets you the diagnosis. The Weber yeah. just tells you which ear is affected, yeah. right? Based off That's of sensory neuronal. Yeah. After you like, after you're like, you just do the test and you're like, okay, left ear seems to be having some issues. Well, let's start from there. Right. Yeah. Um, then you throw in the RINS test, right. Um, and you can basically check both the bone conduction, right, which is going to directly go to the sensory neuronal part of it versus the conductive portion, right? As always, make sure you guys learn it based off of the abnormal because they don't ask questions on what's normal. They don't. Yeah. Okay, so we went over that. Oh my goodness, that this was a question, one question. Um, I'm pretty sure they asked, hold on, let me. Remember, they are not gonna ask you for normal, they're gonna ask you for abnormal. And so I'm pretty sure they put one of these on the exam that was showed some kind of difference. It, I think it was like 
age related or something along those lines. But this concept right here, where it's saying testing auditory function, please do not stress out about it. Please don't spend all of your time studying this. Just understand that, um, just know what it looks like when it's not normal, essentially. Just know what it looks like when it's not normal. Ocular reflexes, I promise you, once you get this down, this is not as complicated as you want to make it. Spend a few minutes on it, um, getting it down. There actually aren't that many concepts in this particular, um, it was this ear and eye or just, oh, oh yeah, ocular. Um, so break it down, chunk it all together. Um, you'll have a, like one or two questions maybe on each. This is the one that gets everybody, the, vestibu the vestibulo-ocular reflex. This is the one everyone has an issue with. So I'm just gonna preface that so you can pay close attention to it. Go to your external resources if you need to um, because um, people have a really hard time. So essentially when the head rotates to the left, which direction? should your eye moves to keep it on the target. So if you go to the left, your eye is going to stay on the target. That's, um, that's the basis of this. So the head rotation to the left induces a vestibulo-ocular reflex to the right. So your eyes are gonna to move to the right as your head moves to the left. Same head moves to the right, eyes move to the left so that you can stay on a fixed target. Why does this happen? Um, um, uh, so the endo lymph flows in the opposite direction relative to, uh, yeah. I feel like that's talking about the, this always gets me. Um, yes. Yeah, the we, same way when you guys are learning. This, always gets me. Yeah. Cause like you, you're sitting there, like the thing is, Brady, myself, and Lindsay have seen this like numerous times and we've like had to learn it every single time right off the bat. But what you need to know with this is that the VOR is only tested based off of SU standard on lesions, right? If there's an abnormal nystagmus, which is just, um, which is eye movement that is not going in the appropriate direction based off of the pa patient presentation versus when you see a regular nystagmus, which is physiological. If you guys have ever seen a train go by and you keep staring at one point in that train and it, your eyes will go back and forth, you can actually give yourself, you can actually throw up, fun fact, by like staring at it for long periods of time um, because you're messing around with the ocular portion of it and your, 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 your inner ear isn't able to comprehend what's happening and it can't shut this down. So that's why Lindsay's emphasizing that you guys learn both the vestibulo ocular portion because they like testing on that based off of comas and other issues. And the, um, the application of this is, uh, if for example, a comatose patient, um, they will put water in the ear to stimulate the movement of the hair cells and look at the reflex, the vestibulo ocular reflex, because when you put water ver warm versus cold, um, it's going to either inhibit or excite the hair cells in the ear, which is going to talk to the eyes to move a certain way. And so um, when that's the basis of this. And I just scrolled through a little bit and this is just the normal right now. This is just talking about the pathway. So it hasn't even gone into the actual testing, um, but they're gonna test you on the actual test. They're not gonna test you on this. Remember they don't really test you on normal. Um, but the base of this is nystagmus, what is nystagmus. So if you try to look and your eye starts, tw I can't do it right now. Um, but your eye starts twi twitching essentially. So alternating eye movement. So the slow phase is, is the reflex. And then the fast phase is going to reset the position and it's the saccadic moments. That's what the nystagmus is. It's the, it's the saccadic mo movements and the direction of nystagmus is defined by the fast phase. So, um, if the fast phase is to the right, then it's a right-sided nystagmus. 
Okay, so pathologic, um, again, going back to the VOR, so in healthy individuals, when a visual field shame, um, yeah, yeah, it's, you're going to have a lesion of the labyrinth. You're gonna have a lesion somewhere if you have a pathological nystagmus. No. So the big one they like to test is the caloric test, um, testings of the VOR. That's the biggest thing. Um, so this thing again, the first image was normal. Um, so cold water is going to reduce the baseline of the cells. And so you're going to have inhibition. And so if, you know, left ear, you are, you should have a slow phase to the left um, versus warm, which is excitation. So um, you, it should go the opposite direction. So cold inhibit, so I'm trying, I can't form some of these guys. I severely apologize. So inhibition on one side, you're going, the slow phase is going to be on that side. But if you excite this side, it's going to go opposite. There we go. Um, so you can have a vestibular lesion, which is going to mess up this whole system, essentially. So if you have no baseline activity because there is a lesion, you can see nystagmus. So, um, so at, yeah, so just at baseline, the non-lesion side is going to be more active. Um, I is to the side of so if you have Kish help me I can't form words um no worries trust me <laughs> even even on a regular day when when you guys haven't done a three-hour review this is hard concept so what I'm going to say is stick to the fundamentals with this um what you need to know is that whenever you have a pathological nystagmus, it's away from the site of the lesion. That is the highest yield point I can tell you guys. Whenever the eye goes to the opposite direction, that is the part, that is the actual part of the VOR that's messed up. So if your eyes are going to the left-hand side, what part of your ear is messed up? Is it the right or left? Put it in the chat just so that I can confirm you guys are still alive and with me. We've lost people. They're going to watch it later. Okay. Um, remember, if it's going to the left, if your eyes are going to the left, then the right-hand side is the one that's affected. Okay? That's important. If the, the eye... The nystagmus. The nystagmus, if... It, yes. The nystagmus, if it's going to the left, right? The pathological nystagmus is going to the left the lesion is actually on the right. That is the quintessential point to know. And if you guys go to YouTube or any other place and they teach you the cow's method, okay, which is like the cold, um, opposite and warm, um, same, you got to remember that's only for patients who are conscious and alive and oriented, okay? Um, we're talking about specifically when the patient is in a comatose state, when you're assessing for how much of their brain function is still intact. And this is why it's so important to know this, right? The doll eye test and all of this stuff, it's testing the VOR and the site of lesion and how severe it is. There are X number of criteria. You guys will probably see it in a DLA. But for the time being, um, I will send you guys a link on how to tackle this, especially on the both the normal versus the abnormal. But I'm going to emphasize you guys learn the abnormal because that is what they ask. Yeah. Um, what else did I wanted to kind of share? Um, remember, in terms of most of this stuff, it's all going to the, um, it's all also getting fed back to the cerebellum. And I'm pretty sure Brady and Lindsay covered the cerebellum with you guys already. 
really important. Um, it's involved with this pathway as well. And it, remember, your movement, kind of fine movement control is coming from the cerebellum. Gross movement is happening with the dopaminergic pathways in the in central nervous system. But here, you got to know it based off of um, that the cerebellum is also involved, like especially the flaconodular portion of the cerebellum. Wow, I can't believe. I sometimes surprise myself with random information that's stored in my brain. How do you? Uh, no, I do the exact same thing. I'm like, oh, I don't know where that came from. Um, the other two high yield points in this lecture are the pupillary light reflex and the corneal reflex. Um, so the basis of this, we talked about the fact that um, uh, there are different tracks based off of where um, images are projected onto the retina to go to the visual cortex to actually um, process the information. Um, and so the pupillary light reflex is you, you know, you're shining the light into one eye and you can tell if, um, and, you, and you see the pupil respond be, to accommodate. Um, so you can text, you can test the direct and the consensual response, um, and you know that, um, and you can know what's essentially lesioned. And so you should have some kind of, um, you should have both. So direct response and consensual response. And if you shine the light in one eye and, you know, direct versus consensual, you can know what nerve, um, is lesioned essentially. That's the basis of the pupillary light reflex. So, so if Lindsay, I'm gonna jump in real quick because um, I got a couple of questions on the nystagmus again. I'm gonna emphasize this point so just so that it's in recording. If the lesion is on the right, the pathological nystagmus is going to the left. And the defining feature of the nystagmus is mediated by the fast phase, right? The fast phase is involved with the resetting of the eye via the saccadic movement. That's the voluntary component. If the patient isn't conscious, right? They're not alive, oriented and functioning. They're no longer gonna have this fast phase to reset things, okay? The slow wave is all, it is the normal, right? I like to think of it, it's driven by the reflexes, the reflexes are reflexes. So if the patient's even alive or you know not functioning, it's going to work. Whereas the fast phase, the patient is at least to a some level of consciousness contributing to it, right? Whether like, you know, depending on the comatose scale that they're in. So I'm gonna put it in the chat as well. Remember that point, it's driven by the fast phase. Okay, that was a question on our exam. Sorry, Lindsay. Very good. So if you um, if you're doing the pupillary light reflex, so just a pen light into the pupil, if you get a direct response, it's the same side as the stimulus. You know, consensual is going to be opposite side of the stimulus. So if you um, do the pupillary light reflex and there's no um, accommodation in either, you know that there is no sensory um, from the eye that you are in versus if you uh there like there's no perception of light in that eye um i think there's a chart somewhere on this but i'm gonna scroll down to see if there's a chart so i remember there being a chart Okay, maybe I was thinking of the corneal. Re oh, here it is. Pupillary light reflex. I'm going to tell you guys, you've got to know this one cold because it deals once again with your cranial nerves. And this is something okay. that they're going to test again in NB2. Um, the high yield points that we were often asked about is the nucleus as well as um, uh, the cranial nerve associated with this whole process. If you guys remember, the pupillary light reflex is mediated by cranial nerve three, right? If you remember that, then everything else gets simplified further. 
If there's an issue with the Edinger Westfall nucleus, then remember there's two of them, depending on the site that you're in, it's going to tell you a lot, right? The pretectal nuclei, don't worry about it too much because that's coming from the eye that you're actually testing. Um, if you have an issue with that, everything gets shut down, right? Like your cranial nerve three is non-functional, right? Because remember your pre-ganglionic parasympathetic of cranial nerve three is not working um, because of the pretectal. So if pretectal, both of their responses is gone, right? Both the sensory component as well as the um, motor component, it's the pretectal that you're likely involved with or um, the actual um, cranial nerve two, which is your basic kind of um, understanding of your optic nerve, right? So the, the basis here, flare light reflex, motor versus sensory, where is the lesion, left versus right? So if you shine a light into your right eye and sensory is sensing it, and then you can have a motor response on both eyes. So if, if you shine a light into the right eye and there's a sensory lesion, you are not going to get a consensual motor response on the other eye versus if it's more if it's a motor lesion somewhere you might not get a consensual um i just lost my words you might not get a response here so you if you get a motor response in the here, left versus right. If you get a motor response in the consensual eye, then there's nothing wrong sensory. So because the right eye sensed it and the consensual response, the motor response was okay. So there's nothing wrong sensory. So it might be motor on the right eye. Conversely, um, the left eye, if you shine it in, if you get both response, you know, sensory motor is good. If you get, if you don't get a response in the consensual eye, you know, it's probably sensory because there's no sensation, but if you get a motor response here and you don't get a motor response on the consensual um, side, then it's going, that's probably a motor on the opposite side. I hope that made sense. So that's the basis of that. And then corneal reflex. Um, because when you touch the cotton ball to the eye, your, your normal is of course to blink based off of this um, pathway here. So same thing, um, do you have a um, response to it, sensory motor? Yeah, so if we have a lesion affecting the pupillary light reflex, so um, shining in the right eye, you have um, both of them reacting. So you know that sensory innervation is fine here versus, wait, is this turned around? No, this should be the right eye. Just, Oh, yeah, there's no the, motor the right response eye. here. There's no motor response here. Right. So, um, so the sensory, the right eye sensory is not working because you're not getting a motor response in either eye versus here, since you're shining the light in the left eye and you're getting a motor response in both eyes, then you know sensory and motor innervation is fine. Did I say that correctly? Yep, that, that was correct. You're good. And just to quickly tell you guys, if you guys have difficulty with this, Ninja Nerd has like a great OSCEs video on like all of the cranial nerves, shamelessly plugging Ninja Nerd, but make sure you guys um, review that because it's going to help you both for this exam as well as your OSCEs at the tail end. Um, same thing here, or same concept here, um, you know, direct versus a consensual response. 
So if there is a lesion affecting it, I don't know what side they're saying the lesion is on here. Um, Oh, it's saying this is the response. So um, where is the lesion? That's what it's saying. So if you stimulate the right eye, there is no consensual response um, versus the left eye response, you do get a consensual response. So, the issue is in the, I don't know how to interpret this right now. <laughs> I haven't looked at this for a while. Yeah, the biggest things here are pupillary light reflex and then corneal reflexes are gonna be the biggest ones on this lecture you need to know for the exam. Lindsay, let me, let me take a shot at this because I got a couple of questions on this um, yeah. personally. Um, so you're, you're shining the uh, light into the patient's right eye, right? That's, that's just saying that you're getting a direct response on the right side, okay? So are we talking about corneal reflex or pu pupillary light reflex? Um, I think this is the pupillary, or sorry, corneal reflex. We're gonna stick with the corneal for, for the timing. Um, yeah, well, sorry, no, I, my bad. Okay, let, let me rewind there um, so that folks know what's going on. Um, corneal reflex, you're you're just irritating the cornea, right? So you basically are um, annoying the cornea, which then would lead to you closing your eyes, right? If you do it on the right hand side, you should have a consensual response on the opposite side because remember they have to work in tandem, right? So you're irritating the right eye, so you're getting a quick right response. But if you're not seeing a response on the left-hand side, the motor portion of it is shut down, right? That's what's being outlined here. When you're doing the left portion, right, it's working normal, right? When you're doing the left side irritation, you're seeing the corneal response. But if you're doing um, the same thing on the right-hand side, it's not, remember, the reflex can be completed because the, there's a motor-specific lesion, right? Um, the direct versus the indirect, just make sure you guys review it based off of the um, video that you guys have on either on Sakai or an engineer because it, it helps a lot. Thank you. Um, uh, bells, the biggest thing here is um, upper spares upper. I'm pretty sure the actual, um, the other lectures talk about it though. I don't. Yeah, for this one, just remember what Lindsay said, upper spares upper. When you guys get to NB2, they cover this much more in depth in terms of the nuclei that's affected, why it presents the way it does for the time being, facial nerve, upper spares upper, lower is opposite. Just keep it simple. Yeah. Okay, thanks for sticking with us through this review. Sorry, we didn't have slides prepared for you. Um, we didn't have slides prepared last time either for NB1, I guess. But um, thanks for sticking through. Good luck on your exam. Let us know if you need anything. Um, reach out if you have questions. Uh, this exam is difficult, but it's not impossible. So please just take a deep breath, trust yourself, trust the information. Um, you know more than you think you do, but we are here for you if you need anything. Thank you very much. It was very helpful. You're welcome. You guys have a great day. Good luck studying. Good luck in the next week. <laughs>